Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to another year of Homeschooling 101. Class is now in session. My name is Gabrielle Critchlow. I am your host for this workshop. So let me just start off with the purpose of this workshop. So the purpose of this workshop, of course, is to um, connect parents to the world of homeschooling and to expose them to the different types of education that is out there. So wherever you are in the stage of homeschooling, whether you are already in it, whether you are trying to figure it out, maybe you're just curious, this show is for you. So wherever you are, this workshop is for you. So since the um, pandemic began in 2020, there's been a surge of demand in homeschooling due to um, either the lack of remote learning or just straight up dissatisfaction with the school system. Last year, we talked about um, the removal of certain topics from school like critical race theory and sex education. This year, it's book banning, health scares, and even more changes in school policies. And so whatever your reason for homeschooling, this event is for you. Excuse me. <clears throat> so now you might have heard about homeschooling, whether in a positive or a negative light, and you just want to know what all the fuss is about. Or maybe you saw that John Oliver episode, right, about homeschooling, and you're, you're like, whoa, you know, maybe that brought you here. I don't know. But either way, our job is to educate you and our job is to explain to you what homeschooling is all about. So now this it's as this workshop is covered, well, not covered by, but it is a part of my company, A Step Ahead Tutoring Services. It, it falls within our mission to tackle academic challenges of all students and to address emotional, mental, and behavioral changes in students, in students, excuse me. And in doing so, we will improve our communities in the process. So if you are watching this live, thank you. I do appreciate that. But of course, the replay will be available on our social media and our website soon. So if you missed any part of this workshop, don't worry, you can always watch the replay and you can start and you can stop at any moment to pick up any little thing. But if you happen to be watching this live, I do appreciate you. But like I said, you can always watch this on the replay. So now I do want to give a small caveat to doing a workshop like this is that the homeschooling laws are different in every single state. So the intention of this workshop is to be very broad. So there may be things that you may hear that may not necessarily apply to your state. So therefore, I do encourage you to do further research into the laws of your state. And throughout the show, we will give you resources to do that. So this workshop is intended to be very, very broad. And so I do encourage you to research the laws of your state. And But we will give you those resources to help you out to help you out with that. Okay, I see a couple of comments. <laughs> uh, Tamara just said that she watched that episode <laughs> with John Oliver. Yeah, so that was uh, definitely a hot uh, a hot button topic there. So maybe we'll uh, pick that back up. All right, so let's get into the rundown for today. So there are six questions that we're going to answer. So I'm going to tell you what those questions are. So I did my best to break it down. So the questions are, the first one is, what is homeschooling? What is it? Let, let's just, that's the very first question, right? What is homeschooling? Let's talk about that. Uh, the next one is a two-part question. What is the paperwork involved and how does standardized testing work? So that one is important. Um, the next one is how do you choose a curriculum, right? So that's another big thing that keeps popping up. The next one is what is a homeschool co-op, right? So that's another important thing. 
Uh, the next one is how do homeschool children get into college? I'm sure a lot of you are thinking about that right now. You may have a child uh, um, um, 14, 15, 16 years old, and now you're thinking about the future. This will be a good question for you to, to, to know the answer to. And the final question is, what are some teaching strategies I can use? So homeschooling is an opportunity for you to be creative. So maybe you need some help with that. There's nothing wrong with that. So we're going to give you some ideas about uh, teaching strategies for that. And I also want to let you know that there is an incentive. So for those of you watching this live, forgive me, my voice is going hoarse. I'm so sorry. But those of you watching this live, there is an incentive. There will be a raffle in the middle of the show. So I encourage you to participate in the raffle. I will provide the link to the raffle in the chat very shortly. So pay attention to your comment section. I will be putting the link to the raffle in there. There's some fabulous prizes. So I encourage you to partake in the raffle. I also encourage you to, um, I really hear it in my voice. I'm so sorry. Uh, but I really encourage you to um, interact in this program. This is not really a sit back and watch program, but if you, especially if you happen to be live, I encourage you to participate, drop those comments, drop those questions, give me those emojis, interact with us today. Let us hear from you. All right. So I think we're just going to get right into it. So I see my first speaker here today. So I'm just going to, um, bring her forward. So first let me introduce her. So my first speak my first speaker for today, her name is Dominique Gates. She will answer the question, what is homeschooling? So let me just tell you about her. First of all, she's a child of God. She's raised by two awesome parents, Terry and Darlene Wilson who taught her the ways of God, and now she's blessed to be a wife to a wonderful husband and friend, Sam Gates. She's a, whole, mm, she's a homeschool mom of three blessings, Donovan, Gavin, and Carmen, and she's been touched with the God-given gift of educating children for over 20 years while being an advisor for parents in deciding the best educational path for their children. Fabulous. All right. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring Dominique to the forefront. Hello. Hi. How are you doing today? Hi. Good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for, you know, thank you for making it. Awesome. Um, Glad to be so here. Now, yeah. So you're going to answer our first question of the day. What is homeschooling? Yes. All right, so Home take it away. <laughs> all right, so I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for inviting us on. And we are always happy to talk about this subject of um, homeschooling. So uh, I have the question, what is homeschooling? And I realized that even though uh, a lot of people know a little, little bit about it, especially since the pandemic started, but I still realize that there are um, different uh, definitions out there. So I'm going to go with the route of just explaining the simple version. Homeschooling is when parents choose to take initiative to take control of their child's education. That's a simple form of what is homeschooling. That is the definition. And uh, that's the definition that we're going to go with, because uh, no matter how you homeschool, uh, you have to remember um, what it is that you want your your child's education to look like and the reason behind you choosing that route. So what what is homeschooling? It's us parents taking initiative and full control over what our children's education uh, what we want our children's education to look like. And so with that being said, then 
um, what is homeschooling to others. It's just a different way of educating our children. Simple as that. Um, some people choose um, the online homeschooling. Uh, some people choose to uh, find the curriculum on their own. Uh, that's a way of homeschooling. Some people choose the homeschooling route of uh, unschooling. Uh, that's another whole nother topic, but there's different um, definitions or ways to homeschool. Um, I personally don't believe that um, the online homeschooling is on schooling. It, it's actually uh, public schooling, but it's online. But since it's done at home, uh, some of us deem that as homeschooling as well. So, um, but there's so many ways to homeschool. So that leaves us with so many definitions of homeschooling. So, and in whatever way you find is best for your child, then that's what homeschooling looks like for you. And so, um, uh, we, I'll, I'll just say, you know, different scenarios of what homeschooling looks like for different people, because that, that question of what is homeschooling and as just as has been stated already is so broad that we can view this question with so many definitions. So I'll just give a few scenarios just in case some is wondering, well, is it possible for me to homeschool with the definition that you just gave? Okay. So parents choosing to have full initiative and control over their children's education, that's the definition of homeschooling. Now, what that looks like, it can look like a parent that works full time and has to educate their children in the evening for an hour. And you say, that's not long enough. What do you want your child's education to look like? That's homeschooling to you. Now, whether they're not getting enough, then we'll supplement it in the daytime. We'll give videos and worksheets and things. And then when, when the parent gets home in the evening, they will pretty much review the child's work with them. That's one scenario of what homeschooling looks like. The next scenario is a stay-at-home mom. Now, that doesn't mean that mom doesn't do anything because moms stay busy. Our work is never done. So the next scenario of what that looks like, a stay-at-home mom is there with her children all day. And, and she's able to make a schedule from the morning to the evening of what her schedule would look like while homeschooling her children. They'll have certain subjects in the morning, they'll have a lunch break, and then they'll have certain subjects in the afternoon, or they can be done by lunchtime. It's whatever she wants their schedule to look like. And then lastly, a schedule of a traveling family. So in all instances, it is possible to homeschool, a traveling family. Maybe dad works in different states and they the family stays on the road constantly, okay? So now you can take your work with you and mom still has full control or the parent still has full control over that schedule, what it's gonna look like, what the even down to what the child is learning, choosing your own curriculum or using something that's already made. It's totally up to them. So that what is homeschooling, the definition is totally on the parent choosing and making uh, steps towards what they want their children's education to look like. Such a broad question, but it's so possible for any situation that any family is facing. That's what homeschooling is. Dominique, thank you so much for answering that question for us. Let me yes. give you a round of applause. Uh, 
have my cheese, my cheesy sound effect. Um, but you know, thank you again for answering that question. And you guys, like I said, um, if you have any questions for Dominique or anything that you hear during the show, please put your Absolutely. questions in the chat and we will answer your questions at the end of the show. So Dominique, thank you yes. again Thanks for your for having time. Me. Awesome. All right. So now moving right along, we're going to go to our second speaker. Um, she is, uh, she's been with us from the very beginning. Her name is Tamara Somerville. And she will answer the two-part question, what is the paperwork involved? Ooh, I'm sorry, I did not take that banner off. All right, so she will answer the two-part question, what is the paperwork involved and how does standardized testing work? So let me just tell you about her. So Tamara is a stay-at-home homeschooling mom and she loves her community. She co-founded the Facebook group, Westchester Homeschoolers to connect homeschooling moms like herself to other homeschooling moms in Westchester County in order to foster relationships, increase, so, increase socialization among other children, and navigate the daunting paperwork for homeschooling in New York State. She also co-authored the book, African American Families, Why We Homeschool, which is now available on Amazon, and she's working on her solo project. So now I'm going to go ahead and bring her to the stage. Hey, how you doing? Hello. Thank welcome, you, Gabrielle. Thank <laughs> you for checking it out. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. All right. So you are going to, this is your, your question. All right. So the paperwork involved and the testing involved. All right. So for that for us. So take it away. Absolutely. So I want to tell you a quick story first. Um, this is my 11th year homeschooling and I began um, pulling my daughter out of second grade. My son was only a few months old. And um, when I sat down to do my first quarterly report, I'm in New York state. It took me two weeks, <laughs> two weeks. I actually found a copy um, here it is four pages long. It took me two weeks to write, and after all these years, I have come to realize that a big portion of what um, took the energy and created all the anxiety around um, completing the paperwork was just the sense of have I done enough? Was I even qualified to to have taken on this 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 venture? Um, did my child actually learn something? What should I have compared them to? Like, what are the other kids learning um, in public school, private school, the other homeschoolers? Did I choose the right curriculum? And some of those questions are going to be answered today. But really, the issue wasn't, can I fill out the paperwork and, and answer the questions that they're giving me? It was really a sense of my own um, ability that I was really challenged with. And so I want to help remove this, uh, this anxiety from, um, um, from the idea of once you decide to homeschool, there's all these things you have to do. Now, I happen to live in New York, as I mentioned, and we happen to be one of the states that I like to call paper heavy. It's actually, it's not, um, it's not a whole lot of work, but it is a number of papers to submit. Um, if you live in surrounding areas like New York and New Jersey, they're very low on um, on paperwork and, and, and reporting things. Um, and we actually have most of our states in this country are, are low or no reporting states. Um, but New York happens to be one of those that um, I, I like to call paper heavy. Other people like to say it's hard to homeschool in New York. That is not true. It's it's you 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 can you're gonna homeschool in any state. The homeschooling portion of the homeschooling is the same. Um, the paperwork you fill out is different by state. So let's start off with that. In New York, like I said, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut are very low to no paperwork at all. I think Connecticut and we have um, Darren from HSLDA on here, so he'll correct me if I'm wrong. I don't live in those states. Um, I think Connecticut, you have to at least once submit um, that you are homeschooling. And New Jersey, I believe, has nothing to do. So in New York, you have your first thing you're going to do is you're going to submit a letter of intent. It basically says, 
that I plan to homeschool my child. <laughs> That's it for the school year. So for instance, I intend to homeschool my child or children, fill in the name of child for the school year, fill in the name of school year. End of paperwork. First thing done. Ta-da! We're complete. <laughs> it's, it's really that simple. Um, the next thing you do is you're gonna complete an, what they call an individualized home instruction plan. It's what are you going to teach? What, what curriculum are you gonna use? And New York gives you multiple options for how to complete that. I choose the easy button route. I just listed some, some the, the subjects we're supposed to teach and the books we're supposed to teach. I include a caveat that says, I may or may not use these books in whole or part <laughs> um, and put that in there. To truth be told, my very first um, IHIP, I also have it with me. I had no money, so I didn't know what curriculum to buy and I wasn't sure like how to teach certain things. So physical education literally, literally says, participate in various group and outdoor activities. That was my phys ed uh, curriculum. My um, history curriculum literally says, America, the story of us, history channel, and the American Experience, New York, Netflix. <laughs> that was my history curriculum. So um, I knew I had to teach uh, teach the subject. It never said what I had to teach. It never said how I had to teach them. So I decided that since I happen to like television. I was going to use TV as part of my curriculum. Um, so that was that was my IHIP. Um, and it, you'll often hear it called that, the IHIP, the Individualized Home Instruction Plan, abbreviated a IHIP, IHIP. And the first one you heard me mention was the letter of intent that um, you'll hear often the LOI. The next thing is the quarterly reports. Please, 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 please. They are, this is the one where I told you it took me two weeks to write. I wrote a four page narrative. I wanna tell you some of the things that are on there. It says for language arts, let me find a language arts one. I won't say her name, but I have two homeschooling kids. Uh, my oldest is a girl who will be graduating this year from our homeschool. And my youngest um, will be entering, he just entered middle school this year. It says the student is reading fluently. She is reading, her reading is increasingly more complex. She's reading more increasingly complex material, including books exceeding a hundred pages. She reads for fun and enjoyment without prompting. She is able to summarize reading both orally and in writing. She has a solid grasp of the narrative's characters, plot, and settings. She can decode three syllable words and increase her knowledge of sight words. She has been introduced to grammar rules, including sentence type, structure, and nouns. Apparently I taught sentences without verbs. <laughs> She is able to navigate books from the table of contents and indexes. She's completed almost 30 different books covering a wide range of literary material, including fiction, fantasy, biographies, nonfiction, folk tales, fables, multicultural stories, and classic reads. She continues to work on improving her penmanship, improving accuracy and legibility. Now, now it is a list of subjects and four columns that says A or B. That's it. That kind of detail, we have never in my entire educational experience, and I have a college degree, I have never received that kind of detailed summary of what um, I had learned throughout the, throughout the quarter on a report card. My report card said A, B, 90, 80. It said one year, for a couple of years during um, elementary school, it said uh, EE for exceeds expectations or NI for needs improvement. Schools don't give us that level of, of um, detail in terms of what did our kids learn. So I stopped doing it too. And it's one of the things that makes the homeschooling paperwork, particularly in paper heavy states like New York, a lot easier. I send them the same paper, update the next column with the same things, uh, either a number grade or a letter grade. Um, they don't get any details. That's it. Um, the last uh, form to complete is an annual assessment at the end of the year. And depending on this is now, again, this is for New York. Um, if you're in low to no reporting states, this doesn't apply to you. Um, but this final assessment is not your fourth quarter report. That's separate. It's a separate assessment of how did your child do for the whole year. The younger years, it can be a narrative. I've chunked it down to one paragraph um, for the narrative report. As your child gets older, you do need to actually complete a standardized test in New York. Some states don't have that requirement. 
Um, but New York has a pretty wide um, variety of tests you can choose from. Um, you get to you as a parent get to choose the exam that you're using, and then you submit the scores. For the last five or six years, I have, um, although I had the option for my son to write a narrative, I've chosen not to. I chose instead to use a standardized test, and I have, um, I've tend to use the PASS exam, P-A-S-S, -S, um, which is a uh, created by a, by a homeschooling company. So I've used that. I've also used the California Achievement Test um, because that one um, is online. And so when I've forgotten to order my test and I knew I wouldn't get it in time, um, I the California Achievement Test is available the same day that you order it. My first year in testing, um, I tested her, I tested my daughter with a group of students. And as it was her first time doing a standardized test, and as the, all, the other students left the room, they had completed the test, she decided, well, she's done too. And her proctor had let her know, hey, um, did you actually, most of this is not completed. She's like, well, it's lunchtime, I'm done. So I obviously didn't submit that test. <laughs> um, but we, we tend to test at home. I've chosen tests that don't revolve, don't it don't require me to have a bachelor's degree. So that's something you need to consider. Some of the tests, um, like the uh, uh, the Stanford test um, through BJU, uh, Bob Jones University, which you can order, that does require a proctor with a bachelor's de bachelor's level degree. Um, I love that Louisiana has no uh, <laughs> no testing involved. Um, that is wonderful. And I would suggest even even where you don't have requirements for testing, just consider consider having them do it so you know where they are, so you know how they rate um, with you know how they how they manage questions, how they deal with time constraints. You don't have to submit it if it's not required in your state, but you may want to know. The reason I started doing the standardized test as early as I did was because my husband wanted to know. And the first few we didn't submit because um, we weren't required to, but I did have them taken. Um, and so there, with, with that testing, it makes my fourth quarter, my not my fourth quarter, my annual assessment a lot easier because there's nothing for me to do. I just take a copy of the results and send them off to the school, um, to the school district. I also have decided for me to make my life easy, I send my letter of intent, my IHIP, um, and my final assessment for the year together. So as I close out one year, I send the stuff for the next year, just so I'm not having to report multiple times. And I want to, I, I want to take off for the summer. I don't want to come back and have to send stuff to the school district. So I do that all at one time. My district also allows me to email them the stuff, so there's nothing for me to mail. I know some people, particularly as they're coming in new. Um, some folks recommend uh, physically bringing it to the school district and getting it stamped. I'm not worried about that. I have HSLDA membership, which I'd suggest you get. Um, so if they ever have a problem, I can prove I sent it. It's sent by email. Um, I do ask them to respond and they typically do. Um, so I have record that they received it. And I just don't want to go anywhere. I don't want to drive to the school district. I don't want to stand in a line. So I don't. Um, and it's really that simple. It is really that easy a lot of the a lot of the anxiety a lot of the pressure we put on ourselves because we're really questioning did i do enough did i do the right thing i see the question about special needs um children and you absolutely can um can homeschool children with special needs there are lots of uh support mechanisms out there i personally think now i will say this i do not have a special needs child um, but in my 11 years, many of my friends do. I've, and, and within our homeschool communities, I'm also a part of Homeschool New York, the New York State Homeschool Group. Um, I, um, I run several classical conversations groups. And so I have access to and I run a Facebook um, homeschool uh, group with almost 2000 people in it. And so I've, I've got a wide variety to choose from when I answer this question. Um, I actually think um, children with special needs do better at home because you can gauge out uh, um, their work on their pace and not on the school's pace. Um, and you can let them thrive in areas that they that they excel in and the way that they can excel, the way that they learn, as opposed to being forced and pigeonholed into um, someone else's timetable and, so, and what someone else deems as important. Um, so th that's the, the, the skinny on homeschooling uh, paperwork. 
it really is not difficult. Um, we can take the pressure off, literally. I, I'll give you one last piece of advice. The school districts are required, um, if you do have reporting requirements in your school, the school districts are required to send you forms. You are not required to fill them out. You are required to submit the information, but you do not have to submit it their way. Um, one of the things that you want to be mindful of is sometimes the school districts, they're going to do what, what's best for them. So they will often, they will sometimes ask questions um, or, or ask for information that's not required by the homeschool regulations. Um, and if you're not aware of the regulations, you won't know that and you'll fill that information in. And then they can use that to start asking everybody to fill that information in. And so uh, talk to um, a homeschool veteran. Um, I've shared with, with, uh, with Gabrielle a, a copy of documents you can use. Um, if you are in New York, you can just literally change, fill in the child's name, fill in the fill in the, the school year, change your, you know, don't if you don't live on 123 Main Street in anywhere, anywhere USA, um, just fill that in um, and you will be all set. And there's a there's a format for the letter of intent, for the IHIP, for the quarterly report and for a narrative assessment. Um, you can find check out your local um, homeschool uh, state regulations. Please, please, please read them. Please read them. That is your best weapon um, in your toolkit for, for homeschooling that's so that you won't have to deal with when you when you do get questions from the school district. If you know your regulations, I've literally, I've lived in three different school districts and I often can answer their questions and concerns with a copy and paste from the regulations and send it right back to them because often they just don't know. They're not trying to be mean and not trying to be bullies. They just they're asking what they think they need because they don't know the regulation. So if you do, that is your best weapon. So that is the homeschool regulations. Um, if we if we have the time, I, I Gabrielle did mention my book will be ready by the end of this month. And for those of you who want it, my e will share my email and, and things later on. A way to contact me if you're interested. Um, it's the homeschool record, uh, getting getting out of my mind and getting it on paper. Um, is the the book uh, that I'm releasing. So if you're interested in that, it's a great story about my first my first uh, report and some interesting and great tips on how to take the stress off of yourself and the, the, the stress that we actually put on ourselves in completing this paperwork. So that is homeschool testing and reporting. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks. much for that, Tamara. That was insightful as always. Thank you so much. For that. All right, you guys. So I'm seeing the oh, I'm sorry. I'm where, where, where are my manners? <laughs> thank you, thank you, Tamara. I'm seeing the comments coming in. I'm seeing the questions coming in. Uh, pay attention to your comments, you guys. I dropped the link to the to the raffle. So this is an interactive program. So I encourage you guys to interact, right? So drop them comments, drop those emojis, um, sign up for the raffle. I put the link in the comments. So make sure you check that out and make sure you fill that out if you want a chance to win some lovely prizes. I'm already seeing the name, so keep on pouring them in. All right, so now we're going to move it right along to the third question of the day, which is how do you choose a curriculum? And I will be presenting that question. So first, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. So as you know, I am the owner and director of the company hosting this program, A Step Ahead Tutoring Services. I receive my I received uh, my master's degree in clinical mental health counseling from St. John's University in 2015. While I attended graduate school, I worked for two companies at which I tutored students at no cost to them. While I was working at both companies, I saw the academic struggles of working class families that were uh, disproportionately people of color. I believe that their little allotment of hours was not enough for them. 
Furthermore, I believe that the children in these families tended to have unknown learning disabilities and were almost illiterate and undereducated. I reached the point when I realized that these families deserved so much more than that. A light bulb went off in my head. I will start my own company. My experiences at these companies provided me with the insight I needed to excel at and enjoy tutoring while inspiring other tutors to do the same. In 2013, I founded A Step Ahead Tutoring Services, and I have operated it ever since. And that's why we are here today. All right, so um, give me one second. I prepared a, I prepared a, a PowerPoint presentation. So I am going to pull that up. There you are. Okay. From the beginning. Got it. Beautiful. All right. So I will now answer the question, how do you choose a curriculum? So what do you need to know about selecting the right curriculum for your homeschool? There I am. Okay. Let's get into that. So let's recap what we talked about so far. So in the beginning, we talked about, well, what is homeschooling, right? That we we just defined that for you. Dominique did an excellent job talking to you about what is homeschooling. Tamara just talked about the paperwork involved and the standardized testing that is also involved. So now we're up to the third question, which is how do you choose a curriculum? All right, so it's seven days or maybe sooner, depending on where you are, before your homeschool starts. So you have you have your school supplies, you have your desk, <laughs> you have your chair, you have your cute storage, you have your children, you have your letter of intent or affidavit, you already communicated with the district but unfortunately, you are overwhelmed because while you have all of these things, you don't know what you're going to teach. Therefore, you need a curriculum, right? So let's define that. When I explain things, I like to break things down into the simplest of terms. So let's talk about what that is first. What is a curriculum? So think of it like a roadmap, right? So it's a roadmap that helps the teacher, which would be you in this case, plan what the student, which would be your child in this case, you're planning what they will learn and how they will learn it. So that may include um, certain materials, certain goals, certain methods, but basically you are navigating the way that your child is learning a select group of subjects. So you are, there's a bunch of things that are involved that you're using to decide how your child is going to learn. So you can customize it to fit your family's needs, right? Whatever is best for your child to help them grow and help them succeed. You have the freedom to decide how you want to organize that curriculum. That choice is up to you. So now when it comes to homeschooling, when it comes to curriculum planning, there are, there are subjects that you are required to teach in order for your child to have a um, what am I trying to say? That they will have a complete understanding of the world around them and to have a, a full, thorough education. So there are subjects that you are required to teach. So let's get into that. So of course, you need to have your arts, right? That might be music, that might be drawing, 
painting, you know, any kind of creative, creative outlook, expression, you got to, you got to have your arts, right? Now you have to have your language arts, which in this case is reading and writing. So of course you got to have your reading, you got to have your writing, right? You got to have your math. I know a lot of you don't like math, but you got to have your math. You cannot avoid it. As, as hard as you try, you cannot avoid math. You got to have your physical development. That might be, um, you know, some sort of um, physical activity um, that could be running around outside, gym, yoga, you know, some sort of exercising that's involved, something that promotes physical health. You got to have your science, right? That can be uh, geography, excuse me, <clears throat> that can be geography, chemistry, biology. You got to have your social sciences. You can have your, uh, your history, your global history. Got to have your social sciences. Technology, so anything involving computers, coding, apps, anything involving that. So for, excuse me, I really hear in my voice, forgive me, bear with me guys, bear with me. So for the um, the pre-K, so I, I wanna say that's between three and five years old, um, there's social emotional development that is involved. So something like that, you may want to consider things like play dates, role-playing, storytelling, or even having them involved in community service, like volunteering, um, um, let me think, volunteering at your church maybe, or a soup kitchen, anything that involves the way they connect with other people. And finally, health and safety. And that starts as young as kindergarten. So that might be uh, anything about the human anatomy or um, human anatomy, what else, um, fire safety, first day training, things like that. So the philosophy of homeschooling, there's three things you want to think about as you're homeschooling. So number one, what type of homeschool do you have? if you already are homeschooling or you think you want to have. Number two, in what ways do you or would you present content information? And the third way is what guidelines or methods do you want to adopt in order to fit your home? So these are the things that you wanna think about as you are getting into homeschooling or if you are in homeschooling already, if you want to evolve your homeschooling. So these are things that you want to think about. So choosing a philosophy is completely up to you. However, you do want to think about what your child needs. So you want to balance what is best for your child in terms of their learning style with your morals, with with your the type of lifestyle that you that you want to excuse me, the type of lifestyle that you're trying to portray, right? So you want to balance what your child needs with the type of morals and the type of, uh, the type, the way that you want to raise your child. Um, you want to balance the two of those things. But of course, that is completely up to you. So on your screen, there are several types of ways that you can homeschool. So there's unschooling, which was mentioned earlier. There's the eclectic method, which is kind of a mixture of a bunch of di different things. There's the Montessori method, which is good if you want um, your child to explore their curiosity, self-discipline, something with sensory development. There's the Charlotte Mason method. If you want your child outdoors more, involved in nature more, short focus lessons, real life experiences. They're learning from literal books, not textbooks, so things like that. There's also religious-based learning for those of you that want your child to be raised more of a religious structure. You can also have that type of homeschooling. So in homeschooling, 
who is the teacher? So number one, you. <laughs> you are the teacher. Number two, you, <laughs> but with an assisting tool. So that might be an online program. That might be a prepackaged curriculum that you just purchase on Amazon. But either way, it's you with a tool. There's a tutor like myself, <laughs> like many other people there. So you are allowed to seek tutors while you are homeschooling. An online academy. There are a lot of academies out there. So maybe you want to homeschool your child, but you just you just don't want to teach. You know, you're welcome to enroll them in an online academy. And homeschool co-ops, which we'll actually talk about later, um, but that is another thing that you can do in terms of who do you want teaching your child. So for those of you interested in a religious-based curriculum, these are some sources for you to consider. I know Easy Peasy is very popular. Um, the Good and the Beautiful is another recommendation as well. So these are some examples that you may want to look into for those of you interested in a more faith-based curriculum. So, um, you know, feel free to, you know, if you're watching this on the replay, feel free to pause and take notes. But um, these are some examples here for you that you may want to consider. So for those of you that are looking for more of an ethnic-based curriculum, right, you want more focused on African-American history or more focused on Hispanic history or more focused on Native American history, right? So these are some examples for you. So these are some examples of um, African-American homeschool curriculums as well as Native American homeschool curriculum. So these are some examples for you as well. Um, so unfortunately, um, there's not a lot of resources for Asian American um, homeschooling curriculum, at least that I'm aware of. So please feel free to correct me um, if you are aware of anything directly focused on Asian American history, but there's not a lot of resources that I found. And these are a couple of Hispanic um, curriculum, I mean, focus on Hispanic history. These are a couple of examples as well. So if that's something that you are interested in, feel free to check those out. Okay, so you want to think about whether you want to use a physical textbook or an online curriculum. Some students do better using books or printed material, while some students do better with online material, videos, computers, things like that. Some students do better with the mix of the two. So depending on the way that your child learns, you may want to find something that will suit them. But what, however your child learns, there's always something that you can use and there is something out there. So you may want to consider, again, would you want something printed on paper or would you want something online or a mix of the two? So when you figure all that out, now you have to decide, well, what is your budget? How much can you afford? A lot of these things you would have to pay out of pocket, but there are things that you can do for free. So it does involve some research. It does involve some trial and error, but that's that's what it all is, right? You're all figuring this out. You can also talk to other friends and family. You can also check social media, but now is the time for you to get in there and do your research and figure out what is best for your child and your budget. So here are some other examples. Um, these are some examples of accredited academies. So Mia Academy is one. Um, Power Homeschool is another one. So um, all Spectrum, I, I can vouch for Spectrum. I actually like Spectrum, but um, those are printed books. So these are some additional examples uh, for you to look into. So if you want something printed versus online, um, Mia and Bridgeway, they are accredited. So which means that they've been vouched for by the powers that be, <laughs> I suppose. But then there are academies that are non-accredited. Um, so if you are interested in any of those, 
here are some more examples. Uh, Singapore Marath is another popular one as well. So here are some more examples if you're looking for something online or you're looking for something printed or accredited versus not accredited. So that's something you want to factor in as well. So going back to which subjects should you teach? So in most states, there are rules about what subjects you should teach. They vary, but in 32 out of 50 states, there are specific requirements. So of course, I mentioned it before, you have your language arts, you have your reading, your writing, your social studies, your science, and your math, right? It's essential for a well-rounded education. So when your child starts ninth grade, so now I want to mention this specifically for people who want to homeschool their children in the high school years, 13 and up. So it's a good idea to find out which subjects are required for college, and that will help you plan their curriculum and, and plan their studies accordingly. So we'll talk more about homeschool children getting into college later, but you want to start thinking about that now, especially in ninth grade. So should you be so bold to homeschool until 12th grade, it's important for you to research the graduation requirements of your state and to make sure that your child meets all eligible criteria, which again, we will talk more about that later. So addition to the core subjects, you may want to include some electives, right? There might be things like music, visual arts, dance, foreign languages. You may want to teach finance, home economics, life skills, cooking. This is your chance to be creative and be open. So you may want to include that in your child's curriculum as well. So here are some uh, additional resources I just threw in here. Um, Bookshark was another recommendation that I got. Um, IXL Learning, I really like this one. Um, IXL follows the public school curriculum. Um, so if you wanted to bring the public school curriculum into your home, you can follow IXL as well. So I actually like IXL. But these are some more resources for you to consider. So this is a very important thing that I want you guys to remember. You can change the curriculum at any time. You do not have to stick to what you're doing, right? So if you decide, you know, if you sign up for one company and then you decide, you know what, I don't like it, my child doesn't like it, you can switch, right? It is not set in stone. You can change it at any time. You have that freedom. You have the freedom to choose your curriculum. You have the freedom to design the curriculum. You have the freedom to change that curriculum. All right, so I uh, just wanted to share these five non-negotiables when it comes to curriculum, right? So in your curriculum, you want to assess your child's strengths and weaknesses by doing tests in reading and math. You can do these assessments. We, It's recommended that you do it three times a year or even more often. So you want to check your child's strengths and weaknesses. You do want to give them some sort of assessment, especially in reading and math. You want to track your child's progress. Take good notes and evaluate their assignments. You want to track their progress and actually physically document their progress. Document, document, document. So depending on your state, they may require you to keep a portfolio of your child's work. So what does that include? That might include their assignments, not just worksheets. That might include real life experiences, essays, projects, presentations. So you may have to keep a portfolio of your child's work depending on your state. So if your state requires it, or if you're just curious, you can also give your child a standardized test, which we referenced earlier, to, and even just to see how they compare with other students in their age group or across the country. That might be something um, that you may want to consider doing, or if your state requires it. And finally, um, you want to choose grade level standards and set personal goals for your family, and this will help 
keep your child on track. So now you may find that your child is meeting grade level standards. You may find that they're falling below a little bit. You may find that they're going above grade level. But either way, you want to kind of start at grade level and then see where they are, right? So you want to track their progress. Are they below grade level? Are they above grade level? And use that to assess where to take them in their learning. All right, you guys, good luck on your homeschooling journey. I hope all of that information was helpful. Um, or you, sorry, I just see a quick note. Or you have just the intent to homeschool and a prayer. <laughs> or you just have the intent to homeschool and a prayer. Thank you, Tamara. All right, I see a lot of comments. Keep it coming, keep it coming. All right, and forgive me for my voice that is going. But yes, uh, so I hope you guys took a lot of notes. And again, if you're watching this on the replay, feel free to uh, pause and rewind and you know, but you have the liberty to do so. So just know that you don't have to stick to any curriculum. You can, you know, switch and choose and, you know, whatever you got to do. Um, and just consider what is best for your child and what is best for you. So you got to have that balance, you guys. It's all about balance. All right. So moving right along, um, I'm going to go ahead to the fourth speaker and then maybe I can give <laughs> my voice a little break. All right, but I am just going to move it right along. So uh, my next speaker is Darren Jones, and he's going to answer the question, what is a homeschool co-op? So let me just tell you about him. Um, so Darren Jones, he has worked at the Homeschool Legal Defense Association, which is also known as the HSLDA, since 1996, first as a legal assistant and then as an attorney in various capacities. He spends his time at the office, 40% talking to members and legal difficulties, persuading them that it's not as bad as it could be and HSL has got their back, 40% advising homeschool group leaders about everything from crafting statements of faith, he prefers the Nicene Creed, to designing policies to protect children at co-ops, 10% writing legal briefs and wondering how in the world documents of 30 pages can possibly be called brief. 10% keeping HSLDA and its sister organizations in compliance with the charitable solicitation laws of way too many competing jurisdictions. And 100% advocating for the fundamental right of parents to direct the education of their children. Darren and his wife, Sarah, homeschool as a team, and I've graduated the oldest two of their four children. He enjoys board games, teaching Sunday school, and speaking at homeschool conferences around the country. So now I'm going to go ahead and bring Darren to the stage. Hey, Darren, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. And how about yourself? Uh, I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> <laughs> the voice okay. is fading. Uh, yeah. All right. So you're going to answer the question, what is a homeschool co-op? That's um, right. All right. And I had put some slides in. Are you able to bring those up on the screen with me? Uh, yes. There, it is. there we go. All right. Wait, wait. I just had it. There we go. Very nice. Okay, so what is a homeschool co-op? And I'm going to kind of start off by going back to the very first question that we talked about for this Homeschool 101, uh, which is what's the definition of homeschool? Now, we got a very excellent practical description of what homeschooling is, but I'll start with the question, what is the legal definition of homeschool? And I have here two options. Uh, depends on the state, or it's a parent teaching her own child for a set daily time using written curriculum. And of course, the answer to this one is, it depends on the state. Some states actually legally define what homeschooling is, and some don't. And so when you're talking with people about, well, I homeschool, you may think of it one way, they may think of it another way. And the state actually might think of it a third way. 
Well, that's kind of similar to what's the legal definition of a homeschool co-op. And again, I've got two possible answers here. It depends on the state, but all states require parental involvement, or there is no legal definition. Well, the answer to this one is actually the red one. There is no legal definition. Uh, a homeschool co-op can be all sorts of things, depending on who you're talking to. So when I'm talking with groups, and I do spend a lot of my time every day talking with group leaders, I ask them, what kind of group do you want to be? And then we discuss their vision and their passion and maybe what resources they have and what area they are and how many children they're hoping to serve. And then I work with them to be the group that they want to be. And so here's just kind of a, a little bit of a, a sliding scale here of different kinds of groups. So I'm going to start over on the, on the left with the support groups. Now, a support group is often a group that's aimed at supporting the parents. So maybe this might be a group that gets together once a month to pray for each other in your homeschool journey. Or maybe it's a group that gets together every Friday at the park to let the kids play and let the parents hang out together. Maybe it's a group that uh, decides it wants to get together to do some things that work well as a group, like maybe putting on a play. Or maybe they have a mom's night out every couple of years where moms get together at somebody's house and they have a potluck dinner. So those are all different kinds of things. Some people might call them co-ops. I tend to call those ones more support groups. Then there are the homeschool groups that do field trips. Um, a lot of homeschool parents are surprisingly intimidated by putting together a field trip. And also, it's fun to go as a group. So sometimes these groups I'm talking with, they exist just to set up field trips or even to let people know about field trips. This particular museum is having a homeschool discount day. This project over here is something that is available for your kids to volunteer in. And then also we've got homeschool sports leagues. When I first moved down here to Virginia in the mid nineties, there was a homeschool sports league that had basketball and volleyball and soccer. 30 years later, almost that group is still going. I think probably a number of the kids who are in it are now kids of the ones who were in it when I came down here. You can also have homeschool groups that put on conferences. Now, often state organizations will do this. Uh, for example, um, up in Massachusetts, uh, Mass Hope does an annual conference. Or in Pennsylvania, in Harrisburg, every May, they have a homeschool conference. But also, you might have a local co-op doing this, maybe in the springtime, to invite people from the community in to find out what is homeschooling. Maybe have them take a look at all the activities that you guys do together. Maybe you're doing a curriculum sale. Those tend to be kind of popular around June or so, where a lot of people are kind of cleaning out the curriculum, which we heard a great discussion about how you choose that. Well, you know, you use it for a year and then you might be done with it. And so maybe your group is going to put together a curriculum fair. Then there's the co-op classes. And, and often this is kind of what people are talking about when they say homeschool co-op. It's homeschoolers getting together to do classes. But even there, it can look different. Now, I was homeschooled my last two years. And some of my best memories are when we did a homeschool co-op together. Uh, we did an algebra class for those of us who are in Algebra 2. There were four of us that year. We did a geography class. We did a drama class. We did public speaking. We did one on architectural drawing. We did physical education classes. And all of these were taught by, well, either parents or relatives. We had a grandparent teaching one. We had a uh, uncle who was teaching one. So that's one way to do it. But it's gotten more and more common 
that these co-ops offer a whole lot of classes. So you might go once a week, say every Thursday, and you get there at 8.30 and there's some sort of opening ceremony for maybe 15 minutes or so. And then your child has the opportunity to take maybe three or four different classes through the day. And you might bring in an art teacher and you'd pay that art teacher uh, to do an art class. And maybe a parent will do a history class next. And then you bring in maybe a retired school teacher to teach writing the next class. And so they've gotten much bigger than just parents cooperatively teaching. And by the way, that's where the word co-op came from originally. And then nowadays you often get bigger groups and I call these ones kind of quasi private schools. Rather than just getting together every Thursday, you might be getting together every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. You're still at home doing some homeschooling. And according to the state law, you may still be considered to be a homeschool student. But a lot of the instruction is going on on these days when you're getting together. Now, when does it become a private school? Well, that's really beyond the scope of this particular homeschooling 101. That's what I spend a lot of my time talking with people is, well, is your group really a homeschool co-op or is it kind of a quasi private school? But these are all different options that homeschool co-ops can be. I will end with three interesting ones that I've come across in the last few years. These were all homeschool co-ops. One of them, well, actually it was two of them. I talked with a group in North Carolina and a group in California, and they both did the same thing, which is they met together a couple times a week on the coast, Atlantic or Pacific, and they did their school right beside the ocean. They would bring along science experiments. They'd bring along notebooks to work on their writing. They would bring along their math books and do math on the beach, set up to work outside rather than sitting inside. I found that fascinating. Another few that I've talked to from around the country are farm homeschool co-ops. They're a family who owns a farm and they have opened it up to have homeschool co-ops come in and have the kids who may only have seen pictures of cows now actually milk the cows. And they may give horseback riding lessons. They may have the kids learn about feeding animals. They may have them work in the fields to find out what it's like to actually plant something, weed something, and then harvest it at the fall time. And then third, another new kind of co-op that's come along in the last probably 10 years or so is the resource center where somebody or some organization owns a building and then they open it up for homeschoolers to come in. And sometimes it's just like a membership. And if you're homeschooling, you can go in and you bring your child in. And most of them require the parents to stay there. Uh, among other things, it keeps your insurance rates a little lower. But then you've got a space over here for computers and you've got a space over here to do art and you've got someone who comes in every Wednesday to give watercolor instruction. And so it's a resource center, kind of like a community center, but for specifically homeschool things. So those are all different sorts of homeschool co-ops. Some of them are open to the public. Some of them are member only. Some of them are very religious. Some of them aren't. Some of them are very formal. My kids were in one that we called the hangout co-op because it was basically you just went to the building and if there was a class here you were interested in, you could go try it out. And if you got bored, you went and played in the gym. Sometimes they're anywhere from three families getting together to 750 kids there on a day. So homeschool co-ops can be all sorts of things. So that's a lot of what HSLDA does is talk with groups like this. And that's an introduction to your homeschool co-ops. Thank you. Thank you, Darren, so much for that. That was awesome. Thank you so much. All right, you guys. So I hope you guys are taking notes. You know, again, this is an interactive workshop, so make sure you drop them questions. Uh, if anything comes up, please put the questions in the chat and we will answer them towards the 
end of the show. I also encourage you guys to sign up for our raffle. So the link is in the comments. So if you want a chance to win some lovely prizes, please uh, sign up for our raffle. Yeah, so make sure you fill fill out that jot form link in the chat and, you know, have a chance to win. Why not? You may be our lucky winner today. All right, so moving right along to our fifth speaker. So our fifth speaker, just check real quick. Yes, uh, the next speaker for today is Laura Nattinger. She will answer the question, how do homeschool children get into college? So let me just tell you about her. So Laura Nattinger is a Texas homeschool mom of 16 years. She has five children, one in graduate school, one in college, and three still at home, all homeschoolers or homeschool graduates. She runs the 7,000 member Facebook group, Austin Area Homeschoolers, co-manages a local co-op, and plan several events and activities for the homeschool community. So unfortunately, Laura was not able to join us, but she was gracious enough to pre-record her answer. So I'm going to play that for you right now. I'm Lauren Hattinger. Um, I'm a homeschool mom of 16 years, and I live in Texas. Um, I have five children, and um, I've been in the college process with them um, twice now. I'm on my third um, high school homeschooler. He's going to be, he's 16. He'll be applying next cycle. Um, and I'm just here to tell you a little bit about what I know about um, college admissions for homeschoolers. It's different. Uh, there's a lot of things that has in common uh, with, you know, the college applications process for traditionally schooled students. Uh, there's, you know, a lot of universals there, but there's a few distinct things that are different for us as homeschoolers. So I'm going to kind of go over that today. Um, I have a daughter who's actually finished with college and she's in grad school. She was a homeschooled all the way, you know, until she went to college. And then I have a son who's a sophomore at a university about an hour from our house. And, um, like I said, I'm going to be doing this again soon. So this is what I have learned. Um, so first of all, um, don't worry about colleges not being familiar with this because, you know, we're now 2023. Thankfully, we've come a long way. This is not the 80s and 90s anymore. Colleges love homeschoolers. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that your, your child will automatically get in everywhere they apply. Of course, they have to go through the same process as anybody else. Um, but there's no longer a, a weirdness to that. Colleges are used to uh, uh, homeschoolers applying and encourage it. And they have information on their websites about, you know, anything special that you need to do as a homeschooler. They have processes, they have homeschool admissions counselors sometimes. They are much more welcoming and accepting and, and happy, I think, a lot, in a lot of cases. Um, to see homeschoolers because sometimes we're unique or um, our kids are, you know, have had a, a different kind of education, but one that brings a lot to the table and um, makes them a really amazing asset to a college community. And so just don't let um, any fears about uh, college, you know, deter you. Okay, it's totally doable. There's a little bit more extra work involved applying as a homeschooler, mainly for you as the parent. Now, a lot of this is state specific. So I pointed out I'm in Texas. Um, you're in another state, you're going to need to follow your state's laws, procedures, policies, standards. Um, so, you know, if any of this sounds unfamiliar, it may not be how it works exactly in your state. Uh, but for the most part, um, you know, the process is going to be sort of the same in the sense that you are going to, you know, somewhere fall of your child's senior year, you are going to, to send off all the application materials through either the Common App or the Coalition App, um, or maybe uh, specifically to the school itself if they have their own application process. Common and Coalition are ways that you can upload all, upload all your materials and send them out to, to multiple um, universities at once and you pay fees for each one, but it's all kind of stored in one website. Um, so really the main difference between you and your family and maybe how your neighbor's family is going to do it is that you as the homeschool parent are going to have to put on your hat as the high school counselor. And so there's some duties that you'll have to do 
that you know your next door neighbor whose kids go to public school didn't have to do um, but they're going to send off a transcript um, and we'll talk about that in a minute they're going to send off test scores unless it's a test optional school which has been a little bit more the trend since covid and um, there's pros and cons to that um, so your child might decide to apply test optional but if they don't they're going to send off an sat or an act score um, and then they're going to submit some essays, probably, depending on the college. Uh, and they are going to possibly send off some recommendation letters. And then they are going to either, you know, fill out the application part that talks about um, extracurriculars and activities, or, or maybe possibly they'll put it on its own resume um, because the colleges are going to want to know how did you spend your time? What clubs were you in? What you, did you do volunteering? Were you in leadership somewhere? Did you have a part time job? How did you spend your time outside of just academics? Um, so all of those pieces are going to be sent off to colleges and, you know, every college's timeline is a little bit different. Typically senior year, you know, September, October, November is when kids are working on their apps. Um, and, you know, there's an advantage to kind of maybe getting some of that ball rolling the summer before senior year, working on those essays. Um, some families hire a coach for that just to help them revise, um, figuring out who you're going to ask for recommendation letters. Um, some colleges are going to ask for them. Some are going to say it's optional. Some might be specific that they want it to be an academic recommender, like a, like someone who's taught them versus someone uh, that knows them in another capacity, like a, a volunteer leader or a boss at a job or um, someone who, you know, has seen them in another area of their life. Um, so all of those things are going to, you know, go through the process and you as the parent are going to kind of oversee that. And the hardest part um, just in the sense that it's intimidating to people is that you will be responsible for developing the transcript um, now again it might be different in your state if you're in a state with like umbrella schools and things like that I'm not so we don't have that it's possible you'll have someone to provide that for you but if you're a homeschooler just doing it on your own like I am um, you know I can either develop it myself or I can pay for a service, which is what I typically do. Lots are on there. You can Google um, inexpensively and find a, a formatting website that puts all of my child's coursework and I input it and it makes it a pretty transcript, like a one page summary of all of the courses that they've had in all of the main areas, right? So math, language or English, language arts, English really, um, history or social sciences kind of get lumped together and then um, biological sciences or, or lab sciences and then um, usually like a, another category for foreign language and then some electives. Um, and those are gonna go off to the school. And the thing with homeschoolers, right, is that homeschooling encompasses a lot of different choices. So some of us have just used traditional materials at home. Some of our kids are doing online courses. Some of our kids are doing dual credit or maybe it's called dual enrollment in your city, which is a really fabulous resource if you ask me. Um, because it can show the colleges that like, hey, my student's already doing college level work, community college level work, or, or maybe even university level work, depending on what your arrangement is in your, in your region, um, kind of shows them that they're ready for the rigors of college, that they're well prepared. Um, so all of those things are going to be kind of put on a master transcript. And sometimes they have what's called course descriptions that accompany them that kind of spell it out in a little bit more detail. You can find lots of sample transcripts online. Um, there's some that are chronological, um, meaning they kind of go 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th. There are some that are subject based. It's just kind of a way how you organize the information. You want to make it really readable to the admissions officer to show them, you know, this is what this student has studied in high school. This is how they're prepared. Um, and then, you know, you're going to sign it, right? Assuming that you're in your state, that's how it works. You're going to sign it as the educational director or counselor. Um, and then all of that is going to get sent off, um, along with all the other things that we just talked about. And they're going to evaluate them and decide whether they, you know, get admitted. And, um, our kids usually do well to apply to a variety of schools. It's possible to apply to just one school and get in. Um, but typically families will want to apply more broadly and get a, you know, wide net. Um, some, for some kids that might be four or five, for some kids that might be 10 to 15. Um, the more exclusive the schools are, the more you're going to want to apply to many of them, right? Um, because we have universities that accept 80 to 90% of their applicants. We have universities that accept 
five to 10% of their applicants. Those are like kind of the, the top ranked schools and the elite schools and the IB schools that are very difficult to get into. Most of our kids are applying to things somewhere in the middle. Um, and so depending on how selective the institutions are, it's gonna dictate how many schools are on their, you know, on their app list, right? It might just be a few, it might be a lot. It also depends on whether you're trying to get financial aid or whether you're trying to compete for merit scholarships or what we call merit aid, meaning those academic scholarships that are kind of like a, a discount, you know, that they give um, the, the applicants that have the best, um, you know, stats, the best, you know, grades and scores and most impressive accomplishments and things that kind of woo them to come to that school. Um, and so typically, if you can apply to several, you can kind of compare offers, and that's really helpful to find the most affordable, best fit. Um, a couple of websites that I recommend for that would be um, College Board, which College Board is who administers the SAT. They have a website called Big Future, and Big Future helps kids kind of narrow down what they're looking for in a college and build a college list. Um, that can be really helpful. Uh, the website Fearless Homeschoolers, I'm not affiliated with them in any way. I've just used them, been happy with them. Um, it is a, it's a blog and, and, a, and a group that you can join and ask questions, really found that really valuable. Um, and so, you know, they've built this list and hopefully you've done some research. Um, I really recommend students kind of take the, take the lead here and be really invested. So maybe as a parent throughout junior year, you're having, you know, monthly kind of little meetings to talk about, you know, or have, you, have you looked into some websites? Have you looked into some schools that look interesting to you? And kind of dig deep and find out, you know, what is their admission rate? What is their score range for the, you know, for the SAT or ACT? Are you kind of in their median score range? But that, that's usually a clue that, you know, you're an applicant that has a strong chance of admission. Um, if you're under that, it might be more of what we call a reach school. Like you're gonna, it's a reach. If you get in, you can try, but it's, it's your stats are a little lower than maybe the average applicant there. Um, if you're over that, then you're well positioned to be offered, you know, a, a merit scholarship because your test scores and your grades and your accomplishments are a little bit on the high end of who they typically admit. Um, that can really position you well to get a good scholarship there. Um, so you, you know, hopefully you've built a list and worked collaboratively with your student so that when the summer comes between junior and senior year, you know, you can start thinking about essays and recommendations and you've hopefully you've documented this whole time, you know, from the time they're 13 or 14, you've documented the course of work they've done, the volunteer hours they've done, you know, things they've studied, even if it's a non-traditional looking format, um, everything that they do that you think would be pertinent to their you know, college preparation journey um, so that when those apps open, you can put all of that information um, in on the either the college, uh, the common app or the coalition app, or whether it's the college's own app, they're gonna ask for a lot of that information. D you know, did you have a job? Did you have clubs? Did you have sports? Did you volunteer? Did you, were there leadership? Things that, you know, that you participated in, um, all, all of, that is gonna go into those apps and it's gonna be something the colleges wanna know about. Um, so all of that is pretty similar. The really, the distinct difference is just that you are overseeing that transcript and also possibly um, you can, as the high school counselor, write a counselor recommendation letter for your child, um, which needs to be like in a professional tone and it's a couple pages that kind of talks about their homeschool journey and. Um, you could even get into things like why and how you homeschooled and kind of what their high school years looked like. Just gives a little context um, to the student. Like I said, colleges are familiar with homeschoolers, but it never hurts to just paint a really strong picture of their strengths and their contributions. And again, why they're going to be an asset to that college. Um, so those are the main things that you're gonna be doing. Um, don't let it scare you. Um, kids can have a very, different out of the box education in high school and that's great and that's wonderful you're going to want to translate it for the admissions counselor so they understand you know uh, what what does that translate to you know um, typically they're thinking in terms of credit so you're going to think about how to present that information in credits form um, and typically colleges will say on their websites 
what credits they would like to see their applicants have. They recommend, you know, applicants have, you know, four credits of math, four credits of English, you know, three to four of science, you know, and you can get that information ahead of time and make sure that your transcript kind of fits that so that they can understand, you know, how well prepared that they are. Um, and, and that's about it, really. It's, um, it's kind of a slog at times. Um, it requires really good communication with your student. Um, certainly, we, there's more we could talk about. There's a whole lot you could research about the financial end of things that are beyond what I can do in this video. Um, but lots of great websites out there. Roadtocollege.com is a really great website um, that can um, you know, illuminate a lot of, and not specific to homeschoolers, but gives lots of information. Um, so I hope that kind of you know, gave you um, a little bit of the basics and give you a little bit of a basic outline on the, the things that you can start doing now and start having those conversations now. All right, all right. You know, all right. Uh, so I hope you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Laura, for that. Um, let me, oh, I think I missed some people with the round of applause, but let me just... my cheesy sound effect in. Uh, but yes, uh, so I hope you guys took notes. I hope you guys, uh, you know, paid attention to that. So for those of you uh, with children in the high school age, you know, maybe as young as 13, now is the time to start planning for college, right? Um, I also want to throw in this little tidbit. Um, uh, I It might just be New York, uh, but hopefully someone can correct me, but you can also have a child take the GED exam. So that's another way to kind of, uh, well, let me choose my words carefully, but that's another thing that you can do <laughs> um, is to have your child take the GED exam. And, you know, when they get the actual diploma, then they can use that to apply for colleges as well. Um, so the GED exam, that's another resource. And again, um, a lot of schools are, test optional. So they don't have to take it, but I like to tell my parents, I encourage you to have your children take those tests. Um, so the SAT, I would also recommend the ACT. Uh, well, either or, make sure you pick one. Um, but when they say test optional, take the option, right? Because you will be ahead of the game of everybody else. So I just wanted to add those little tidbits as there as well. Uh, Tamara gave a little tidbit here. Let me just share that. College credit in high school also gives a leg up when applying applying for college. That's another tidbit for you there as well. So, so all these tips are coming. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. So, all right, you guys. So now we are nearing the end. So now we are going to, well, we're coming to the end of our question part. So now we will have our, our final speaker of the day. Her name is Jen Sixth, and she will answer the question, what are some teaching strategies I can use? So let me just tell you about her. Have you tried to explain an assignment to your child only to find that your explanation wasn't understood? Did you lose your child's attention? Did both of you walk away frustrated? Were your child's needs still not met? Here comes our speaker, Jan Sixth. She has written two books to explain all of that. One, Teach Your Child to Learn, A Parent's Guide, Simple and Tested Techniques That Work. And two, Teach Your Preschooler to Learn, A Parent's Guide, Teaching, uh, no, Preparing Your Toddler for School. On our YouTube channel, Jan Six Tutor One, she has created resources that help both students and parents. This includes over 1,200 targeted educational videos for ages preschool through 12th grade in a variety in a variety of academic subjects. Parents learn how to teach basic foundational concepts calmly and smoothly when helping with schoolwork. Her philosophy. Homeschoolers learn best with a well-organized curriculum, there's that word, that pairs strategy with efficiency. And our final point, Jan has been a teacher and private tutor for over 45 years. 
There you go. So our speakers are coming with experience and years under their belts. All right. So now I'm going to go ahead and bring Jan to the stage. Hey, Jan, how you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you. How about yourself? I'm good. I'm good. I'm hanging in there, but I'm good. All right. So you're going to you're going to drive it home for us, Jan. OK, we will do. Well, this is the fun part of the of the uh, whole presentation for me because I get to talk shop. But there's been some really good information that that has come uh, forward. And uh, I now want to share some of the things that you can do to help your child along the way. One of the things that causes a lot of stress for for uh, parents and homeschooling uh, caregivers is that they don't know how to teach the, the uh, skills. I'm into pivotal skills. This would be uh, foundational. If you just stayed within the realm of foundational skills, you would be setting a very good foundation for your child. So let me give you an illustration. We all recognize these as tools. The tools of the, uh, the carpenter, the tools of the cook, these, all of these tools have certain uh, reasons why you've picked this up. They have certain um, um, they, the, the tools that they have that, that we're talking about have certain purposes. The same way as there are certain tools of learning that I call the pivotal skills. So in my uh, in the in the books, the the teacher child to learn book was the first one I wrote in 2012. These were actually my tutoring techniques that I've used for all these years. And then uh, the year a year later, I did a preschool book uh, showing parents how to prepare their child to be able to get some of these uh, concepts that are later memorialized more academically. So uh, coming back to my tools, we have two screwdrivers, but that the slotted screwdriver and the, the Phillips have specific reasons for and purposes for their use. So the, the, um, the skills that I'm going to talk about here are foundational, they're fundamental, but they they also lay a foundation for a more complicated use of the same tool. As a parent, these are very easy to teach and they're not really all that intimidating. So I started out each chapter in the in these books talk about a specific subject. I get right to the point so you don't have to spend a lot of time and effort uh, researching this. It's kind of laid out for you. The, the books themselves are pretty short. I know that you're busy, so it, you don't have a lot of time for, for doing this research. You'll be spending it on those college applications anyway. So I'm going to take this subject by subject and give you the pivotal skill that has helped me teach for the, my tutoring career and also will help you lay the foundation for your child. So the first subject, the spelling. If you only could know one thing about spelling, it would be teach your child phonics. The phonics are the sounds that the letters and letter blends make. So the initial sounds of the, the alphabet letters, your child needs to be able to recognize that the T says a t, -t sound. So not only recognize the letter, but the sound, and then fold in what I would call the blends. These are consonant blends like blah and bruh and cruh, and there's plenty of them. These actually though are in so many words that they, uh, a child could, can see the blended part when they're reading, you can say there's a blend in this word and they might be able to just give you the first sounds of it and then that helps them actually uh, on their road to the learning. Co coupled with the long, short, and R-controlled vowels, we can certainly make words out of this, like this, aid, bl blade. All right, so there, 
there would be the, the, the phonics themselves, the letter sounds, the vowel sounds. I do the long vowel sounds, the short vowel sounds, our controlled vowel sounds, like in car or far, and then some that are just a little weird, but they're, they're in a, a number of, of words that your, your child will see in the, at the beginning stages of reading. If your child is older and you fear that they aren't reading on grade level, again, you need to start back at this level and give them the foundational skills that they need in, in, for the, the reading itself. Now, that, this is a tool that's like the, here's the tool, but now here's the more specific one. You can use these blends and letter sounds in your spelling. I've put together what I call a spelling organizer. There are different columns that are featured here that, that uh, spell out the blends, the long, short, our controlled vowels, the same things we were just talking about when a letter is silent, and then teaching the prefixes and suffixes. These give that the child that foundational learning that transitions into not only the reading skill, but also the spelling skill. I don't have too much time in this segment, uh, so I'm going to just go along as fast as I can with it. If you could only know one thing about grammar, it would be the parts of speech. Nouns, pronouns, adjectives, um, conjunctions, prepositions, these are the building blocks of grammar. And the, the, the way that they are arranged in the sentence structure gives the comprehension. So if your child has a foundation in the grammar, you are setting them up again for this uh, reading proficiency. In the writing category, I would suggest that you would teach sentence structure. I teach three types of sentence structure to begin with. A simple sentence, compound sentence, and a complex sentence. The, the, um, there are many variations, but if a, if a child understands how to, to produce the simple, compound, and complex sentence, they are well on their way to being able to share their ideas with you in writing. These techniques are explained in the, the books that I've written and they're, they're memorialized in all of the, the videos that I have on the YouTube channel. If you, you, if you look at the videos in the, in the order that I've placed them in, in the playlists, you will have a, a very good understanding of how to teach to your child, or you might just be able to put your child in front of the, the uh, YouTube channel and uh, let me do the te teaching. But familiarizing yourself with these techniques will give you the confidence that you need to be able to explain it to your child or help in other ways. The, everything that we've talked about so far now goes into the more complicated concept of reading. When, if you could only know one thing about reading, it would be, what's the purpose of reading? Why am I reading this? You might be reading uh, instructions on uh, a recipe, or you might be reading social studies or science that uh, are factual in nature or you might be reading a novel or short story where the information, which is basically who, what, where, when, why, and how. This is what's explained in most reading material. When you get into the fiction reading, they just call it by fancier names. Now the who, what, where is character, plot, setting, theme and point of view. Again, all explained in the books and in, in the YouTube vi videos that are free. 
when I do, when I'm teaching a fiction, fictional reading, this would be more for pleasure or, or books that are um, perhaps like uh, Shakespeare, I have devised what I call a story plot line. This, this plot line actually helps a student understand that the story starts out here with a couple of the inf a couple of the elements of the story, and then there's a, there's rising and falling action in this plot line that gives the student an understanding of of how the story is moving along. If a child uses the the ideas within this story plot line, I've simplified it as much as I can and borrowed from other resources that I've used too, um, the child will be able to understand how the story goes along. So you don't have um, a book report that goes and then, and then, and then. It's, it's uh, introduction of some of the characters, initially what sets, uh, what gives the, the main character a problem and shoots it up into this uh, rising and falling action that ha is happening on this until finally the story has a climax where the problem that the character received way back here is solved and then the story is over. If a child was able to take any reading material that was fictional and use these ideas, the book reports would go flying out of them. If a if a student is reading nonfiction source, like a social studies or a, a, a science, then I teach note-taking skills. And the note-taking skills, again, are something that grows in, a child grows into this, figuring out what imp, in, information in the, in the written material is important. Usually textbooks are so, um, they're so interested in having the child understand what is going on that the, the child can actually follow the headings and the subheadings, the, uh, some of the more in, most important information like the vocabulary or concepts are highlighted, bolded, or italicized. So I'm having, uh, I teach my children to uh, look for those helpful hints. A textbook also is very interested in, in having your child understand. They might put a word bank at the side and all of these are ripe for the, the kinds of test questions that are or essay questions that are usually asked. Uh, <clears throat> the the uh, math section if you only, the math ha section actually has many, many things that are important that are foundational skills. But if you could know only one or two things about math, the operations of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division have basic ways that those uh, operations behave. So you would be teaching at a foundational level, level the uh, the behavior of an equation or a number sentence that is involving addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division. This dovetails into your algebra and it, uh, in all of the uh, upper equations that are so scary in, in middle school and high school, but really don't need to be. Place value is another uh, foundational skill that is important that a, a student understands that I've now given this place value townhouses. It seems to me that that uh, all of these uh, place values rest in what I would call townhouses, where the houses themselves have three categories. In the first one, we've got the ones, the tens, and the hundreds column. And then next door to that, that's where the thousands family lives. And they have the ten thousands and the hundred thousands that live in that family unit. Then we've got the millions, 
and that was, that's repeated, 10 and 100 million. Uh, and then we're over here with the billions family. So you can see that, it, that this helps a child kind of understand what that place value is all about. Uh, and when we get into decimals and fractions, the decimal side of this is this one I've colored differently because it's got only two members that live in that household, the tenths and the hundredths. I make a big deal about the, putting the TH on the end of them to distinguish and so forth. These are also on the videos on YouTube and they're also in the books. So you can actually bring yourself up to par with it by just doing a little bit of research on the side so you know uh, if you peruse the videos first, you'll have a better understanding of what to say to your child. Now, the, the one uh, operation of multiplication is very foundational. The, if, a, if a child doesn't understand or remember all of the addition or subtraction facts, they have their own ways of doing this. They count on their fingers or they, you know, they can manipulate other uh, like counters that they could use. But the multiplication tables, if these facts are not learned well, it really slows down a child and makes upper math so much more, so much harder for them. This is usually the chart that you see in uh, most textbooks that show multiplication answers where we've got uh, the horizontal and vertical rows coming together to give the answer to the child. But this chart is so intimidating that most kids uh, really revolt with this. I've narrowed it down to this chart. These are really only the only answers that you're going to need. And this chart is not intimidating at all. So if you're if you would like a way of teaching your child to remember the multiplication facts that really does work, please check out those videos on the YouTube channel that talk about multiplication. I have uh, videos on there of how to, how to learn them and then how to use them. Another math found foundational skill would be being able to read a clock. Uh, if you introduce the, the, the uh, analog clock, you should also introduce the digital. Here, their child is going to see uh, the digital clock probably more often, but this is still around. And in, in uh, showing the child the, the analog clock, you can also get them prepared to see angles. If we have like the nine o'clock time, it's going to be easier for you later when you're explaining um, geometry to them to show the, the right angles on this. Here's an acute angle. I can make an obtuse angle with these. And if you just, if you just are showing, there's an obtuse that is more than 90 degrees and we have the back of the angle too. All of these are the geometry that's so scary in high school. And you can go right back to the clock and your child can identify pretty well. Teach money to your child. When you, when you um, work with money, I would suggest working with real money so that your child understands the quarter, the nickel, the penny, and the denominations of the, the paper money. Um, with the uh, science and social studies, I'm going to back up again. I forgot to do this one. It was out of order. Note-taking skills are very important. And this one is the flashcard, baby flashcard, that I've, the, this technique I've used many, many times with uh, the students that I work with, with biology or, or their um, other their social studies, their history classes and everything because a lot of those um, disciplines are heavy laden in vocabulary. Those are also explained on the videos. I don't have the time to do that 
right now with you. I've only got a short amount of time to, to show these to you, but they are very much well uh, explained on those videos or in the in the books. The last one, last thing that I want to talk to you about is as a homeschooling parent, please, please uh, instruct your child in organizational and study skills. Time management and, uh, you know, just keeping track of their assignments when they're due and uh, deadlines and so forth. These executive skills really are very far reaching. An employer really wants the, the same thing that the school districts really want. That is, show up on time, be prepared, and, and uh, use your time as wisely as you can to get things done. This is what the, the organizational and study skills are very, very important for your child to learn. And at, at, any, at every age, and you're, you're setting them up for some, some really um, a quality education and also some quality skills as they move into their more adult life. Uh, that is really a very much of a horse race through the techniques, but I'm sure that the resources now that I've, sh I've suggested and the, the free resource on the videos on YouTube will help you Im immensely. So good luck. It's really a lot of fun to work with your child and see their growth. Thank you. Thank you, Jan, so much for that. All right. So I know uh, time is going. So I think we're just going to go ahead and jump to the question and answer part. So Jan, I'm just going to leave you up there. Um, let me bring my other people with me. Um, one of them just had to run. So I think we're just going to go ahead and dive right into question and answer portion. Um, all right. So let's see. I guess I don't know if you want to bring up the John Oliver <laughs> segment about, <laughs> about homeschooling. Um, uh, but basically, um, I guess the highlight of that segment was that um, it's it, it's easy for child abuse to happen because um, there's not a lot of oversight as um, public schools provide in terms of mandated reporting. Um, so Darren or, or any one of you, I guess if, if you can shed some light on, on that in terms of um, child abuse and homeschooling and if you could talk about that. I, I just want to jump in real quick because I've seen it. Um, I don't know if everyone else has seen the, the segment. Um, uh, his show in general tends to highlight specific and narrow things of any particular uh, topic. Um, and I think it's, I think it's kind of funny, um, but I, I watched it. I watched it with. I watched it with 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 my eyebrow raised and like, where did you find that information and what are you basing that on? Um, because I don't think they, there was no comparison between that same issue in public and private school. Like, it's yes. Does it happen? It probably does. It. it um, is it easier to report? Probably not. Um, but it's, I think it's very skewed as to, it made it, it made it seem like this is such a wild and rampant thing going on and people are pulling their kids out of out of uh, public and private school just so they can be abused. And that is not the case at all. Um, so I just wanted to say that because I, I, had, I had seen it um, and I've been talking about it with other people. I actually haven't seen the segment. Um... Our, our media relations department has that joy of watching things like that. Um, I will say HSLDA takes child abuse extremely seriously. We actually have an entire section of our website devoted to uh, symptoms of child abuse, your reporting requirements, how to avoid it, uh, how to protect your own kids from it. Uh, one of the things that I do when I'm talking with homeschool co-ops is I tell them, 
one of the most important policies you have to have is how you're protecting the kids in your co-op. And things like your standard, you know, always have two adults present. So, yeah, it, it's we take it seriously. Um, I, I think our solutions of making sure that groups and parents know about it and how to prevent it uh, are better than, you know, mocking the homeschoolers who are trying to do what's right for their kids. I mean, do you think there should be some more oversight, like, you know, like mandated social worker visits or, or something like that? No. I don't think that's, <laughs> I, I don't think that's a good solution. No. Um, I mean, we're not Scotland, which suggested something similar back, what was it, 10 or 15 years ago? You know, for every child who was born, they'd have an oversight agent of the state assigned to them. Here in America, we trust parents to do what's right. And if they don't, CPS in every state has jurisdiction to investigate child abuse and child neglect. And that law applies to homeschoolers just like it applies to every other parent. All right, awesome. awesome. What he said. Right. There you go. All right. Um, all right. There's a question here. I'll put this one up on the screen. Is it possible to homeschool in another language that isn't English as long as the child also learns English? Simple answer is yes. Um, I, I, English is our main language, um, but I do, I mentioned, belong, I oversee classical conversations in New York State. Um, and so we have, um, we have over a thousand families um, that are in our groups just in New York, and that doesn't include New York City. Um, so many of our families um, have a teacher teaching Portuguese at home, Chinese at home, Korean at home. Um, it's actually better if you do speak another language, I would highly suggest you teach it to your children. Start with them, they'll get English. They, they are, if, if you bring them out the house, they'll get English, um, but definitely teach your, 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 your mother tongue um, and start from an early age. A bilingual children, um, their, their ability to think through things because they tend to think that they're now thinking in two languages and they're constantly decoding um, the two languages, their ability, their critical thinking abilities are skyrocketed simply because you taught them that, that other language. Absolutely. I agree with that totally. In fact, the, uh, the bilingual family is, uh, uh, children often take a foreign language in, in middle school and high school anyway. It's usually a requirement. If they are, uh, if their parent has another language uh, that they speak, speak fluently, I would suggest that English is their second language, Jen, and they should, they should know both. The same, the same principles that I was talking about though before, the letter blends, the sounds and everything, just put it to the other language because it, it, I don't know Chinese because I do not know the characters and what they stand for. But if, if a person taught me that, and taught me the sounds, I could de I could be able to use that language too. So go for it, parents. You got it. There's a couple states that actually require that the instruction be in English. Um, we've argued in the past that's probably not a constitutional requirement, but if parents in California have this specific question, they should contact HSLVA to discuss that. Okay, and uh, and I will even chime in. Um, it's you know when I when I was you know referencing in my presentation about um, social emotional development, definitely starting young and you know incorporating things like play dates, um, especially when you're learning another language. Uh, another language, um, it might help to have them socialize with other people that uh, speak the language, especially uh, children in their age group to encourage conversation like even thinking about you know all the times i had to learn italian right it's all of it was conversation and quizzes and testing and so the same way that you teach in english you teach that in that other language as well and starting with phrases uh common phrases 
colors, months, days, mm-hmm. starting with that, then conversation, then even, um, you know, going to the another country where it's spoken, you know, um, and maybe looking at things like the, Char- the Charlotte Mason mes- method, where it's about the outdoors, right? So um, definitely incorporating it into your curriculum and, and using it to learn that second language, I think it's, it's very helpful. I've tutored many students that were foreign exchange students and uh, where the, it was the, the language was the barrier. They were very smart people, but they, they didn't know the language. I put a whole section on the, the YouTube videos on, for English as a second language. So if, it, if that's uh, helpful to anybody listening, please check those out. And yeah. I'll also add, um, if you're watching TV, turn on the closed caption in that other language. Mm-hmm. Good. Good point. That'll, that'll help give you some of that, some of that, um, that nat- just hearing the language spoken naturally um, or, or being able to translate it back and forth. So switch to switch back and forth between listening to it in that language and, and reading it in English or listening to it in English and having the caption on in the other language. Absolutely. And, and, and even reading, right? Simple reading, right? Um, you know, as I tell parents, you know, have the child read a little bit every day to improve spelling, grammar, punctuation, all that. The same thing goes in that other language, right? Have your child read something in that language, right? So they yes. can, um, you know, see the way things are spelled <laughs> uh, when things are, how things are pronounced. Um, especially in other languages, they have the the unique uh, punctuation symbols uh, that's not found in American language. Um, you know, you will see that in in text, right? So having the child actually uh, read other things in those languages, so they can see that you know that's another way to incorporate. I think um, that language, I think language is the key to all learning. And the more language you can give, particularly to your preschooler, is that it's all about the language. They have to understand concepts of short or longer, heavy, uh, up, down, in between. Those are all concepts that are learned. Absolutely, absolutely. All these are good tips, and I hope you guys are taking notes. Um, I, I see a lot of uh, comments. I, I'm loving. I think I'll share this one here. Um, Dina, I, I see a lot of responses from you. I love it. I love it. I love it. I never thought about the child abuse aspect in homeschooling. However, one of my reasons for homeschooling was my child being bullied in public school and the school not taking responsibility. So uh, that's a, a common reason for homeschooling, I think, is because of of, of, of bullying. So um, I know Dan and um, Tamara, you guys are homeschooling parents. Can you talk about why you chose to homeschool if you're comfortable sharing? Sure. Um, I have, a, I had no issue with the school. My, my daughter was in a private school, so it was a Christian private school. Um, I honestly just wanted to spend more time with them. <laughs> um, it, I wasn't unhappy with the school per se. Um, I just really, I just, I, I really wanted to be with them. I had a, an amazing um, summer um, where I had planned, you know, the schools tend to give uh, summer work and I had planned this entire um, kind of mommy day camp with my youngest and my daughter was supposed to go to summer school, summer camp um, at her school. And he decided she didn't want to go. She wanted to stay with me. So I revamped our year our summer to include getting her schoolwork done um, and still having fun. And I honestly thought I knew one person at homeschool and said, I think this is kind of homeschooling, so I want to try it. <laughs> so I had nothing I was nothing that had pulled me out of the school, nothing that I was running from, nothing that I didn't like. I just really liked them and they pulled me in. And I have enjoyed 11 years of being with them nearly every day. And I'll be graduating my first one this spring. Yay, 
for me and for my wife, both of us finished up in homeschooling. I did public, private, and then home. My wife did public and home. And we both liked homeschooling best of the options that we did. And so we've got a couple of kids where it probably wouldn't really have mattered whether we did public or private or homeschool with them. Uh, but we've got a couple that we call our quirky kids. And for them, homeschooling has worked great because we were able to match the education to the child rather than trying to force a star-shaped child into a circle too small for them. I actually had an experience with this too. Uh, my daughter asked if I would relocate and help take care of two of my preschool grandchildren at the time so she and her husband could work. And uh, I did that. Uh, I had I had written the 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 first one. I knew my tutoring techniques worked because I've seen it happen again and again, but I wasn't really sure about the preschooler one. And I I uh, tested them out on those two <laughs> children, uh, my two little guinea pigs, and uh, both of them read with with comprehension by the age three, and they could also do math. It was pretty shocking to me that 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 they work so well so i admire all of the uh the parents that uh homeschool i have deep respect for you can i just add gabriel um yeah. in light of what jan just shared um one of the projects i'm working on is um a, a larger book uh everybody homeschools and it's the idea that when you have children at home, whether they're in school full time or you homeschool them full time, there is some part of the day and week where you are the one educating them. Whether it's whether it's just that you educate um, after school for home for homework, or you're educating um, them in a in a non academic subject, every parent and grandparent, when you when those kids are in front of you, you are their teacher. And I think when, when we really understand that concept and take that to heart, we recognize the transitions between homeschool, public school, private school are quite easy when we realize we're the ones responsible as parents, um, as, as guardians of children, that we are homeschooling them. It just may not be full time. So yeah. I would consider myself a full time homeschooler. Um, but I think every parent, um, every guardian is, is a homeschooler. They just, they just may not be teaching academic subjects or they may not be teaching full time. You're right. You're, the parent is the first teacher. That's my opinion. And uh, I, it, you have to talk to your child anyway. You might as well be talking about things that they're going to need later. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Why not? And then make it easy on yourself by incorporating it into the curriculum. Yes. Right. So there you yeah. go. Um, so I, I'm going to bring this comment back up about, um, can you homeschool a, a special needs child? What do I need to do as far as receiving services if being homeschooled? So, um, I, I will say a lot of the services, um, that schools offer, you can get privately, um, and that might actually be preferred. So um, things like getting your child evaluated for learning disabilities, you don't actually have to go through the school. Um, you can go through your, your pediatrician. Um, might be better if you go through an actual neuropsychologist, but you can do it privately and get that evaluation privately in terms of services that are available. Again, you can get all that stuff privately if they need um, occupational therapy, if they need um the assisting technologies to help them read um, if they have this uh, dyslexia for example you can get all that stuff on your own right so you don't necessarily have to go through the school, the school to get it you can get that on your own um you can get it through your i think you can get it through your health insurance you yeah. can okay <laughs> so you can your insurance can pay for it yeah, I'll add, um, when I was a chapter leader for um, Homeschool New York, that's the New York State Homeschool Group, um, one of the things we would we would consistently counsel parents while this 
this, the, our state regulations allow for parent homeschooling parents to receive services from their school district when they have special needs children. The reality is the school districts don't have enough resources to give the kids in the school the resources they need. So imagine now trying to include students that are not physically present at school, um, those same resources. Because that's now, if they, if they don't have enough uh, teacher's aides or um, therapists or assistants to support the kids who are physically sitting there, <laughs> um, it, it, the, 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 the reality of what you're going to get is going to be far below even what they don't get at the school. And so um, you're, you're mentioning you know, getting that on your own. That's, although it's technically free um, when you do it through the school district, you're not getting that value. So it's, it, it is actually better to do it outside. Yeah, yeah. Um, I see a comment here from, oh, hi, Cara. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, she says, in Utah, where I am, the school still has to provide assistance for my kid, even if he is homeschooled. So the school provides my kid with the tutor for this dyslexia. Okay, so that's, you know, thank you for sharing, Cara. Um, so depending on where you are, the school is still required to provide services, even if your kid is homeschooled. So that's interesting. I didn't know that. All right, thank you for that little tidbit there. Um. Okay, let's see. What? Oh, uh, so let's see, not a lot of questions. So I guess let's, let me bring up the, the myths. One of the myths about homeschooling is uh, socialization. Um, the, you know, the misconception about, um, you know, kids are just locked up in their homes and, and being coddled and, you know, what, what are your views, apparently. About <laughs> and they come out weird and, <laughs> you know, so what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I'm going to, my first year homeschooling, um, believing that idea of, oh, you know, my kid needs to be socialized. They need to be around other kids. That was all well and good. And we got no schoolwork done because we were constantly going somewhere to do something. Um, and there were a lot of great enrichments, but reading and math was suffering because we weren't consistent. Um, so the idea of of you've, you've got to have a balance. Like, yes, there are there are classes. Yes, there are a bunch of trips, um, but you've got to make sure you, you, you've, you've scheduled out still actually doing some work. Um, and this year, like I said, it's our 11th year homeschooling. My son is in a weekly, a weekly co-op classical conversations on Tuesday. He has violin practice, violin lessons on on Tuesday after. Also, he just left to go to karate. Um, he's in an art program on Wednesday and Wednesday and Friday, and he does something else. And he does kayaking. My daughter's in a music program. Um, she's in ballet. She's in theater. Like the kids are never here. Um, so you do want to be mindful. There are plenty of things you can sign them up for. They're going if you let them out the house they're going to talk to people. Um, and the reality is when we talk about socialization, what we, what we really mean is that they're with other people. But if we're actually wanting our kids to socialize, to interact with people, that is a learned skill. Because we constantly tell, we, we have this, 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 other, this other thing kind of playing in our head, don't talk to strangers. Well, how are you gonna meet anybody? So we tell our homeschoolers, talk to strangers. So they will go outside and just talk to people. Um, they're not, they're unafraid to be involved in conversations with adults because they're with adults most of the time. They're, they're, they don't feel a barrier of, oh, I got to raise my hand to talk or I have to, you know, this is an adult conversation. I'm not allowed to be in it. They'll ask permission. Can I inter, can I interact? Can I, can I step in? Um, but they're, they feel like they have a place, like they're full, full human beings. Who are, who are allowed to participate in conversation, to use the, the one gift that separates us as human beings, which is language. Um, and so if we're talking about physically being with other people, again, homeschooling is, doesn't mean that you, that you never leave the house. The same, the same as working from home doesn't mean you work at home. Um, so it's, it's, it's a nuance. 
And what we really, what we really want is that our kids spend some time with some other kid that's their age. And we think take it back to school, to physical school. They don't actually spend much time socializing. They're in the same room with a number of children for a certain hours of the day. And then they have like these little breaks between classes and they have lunch and they have before school and after school. If you add all that time up, it's not a whole lot of time. They're just physically with someone behind, looking at the back of someone's head and they're being instructed. <laughs> that's not socialization. That's just, that's just physically being, it's a difference between like spending time, like if you're on a date with someone, if you're like, I'm, I'm married. so. If my husband says we're it's date night and that just means we're physically in the house together, that's not a date. <laughs> we actually have to do something and talk to each other for it to be a date, go somewhere, have some sort of ex experience. And that's what we're comparing it to. We're comparing homeschooling to going to sit in a classroom with 15 other kids. And that's not socialization either. That's my two cents. I don't think you should worry about the socialization too much, especially if uh, you're involved with other homeschooling families. Those co-ops that were discussed earlier, uh, those sounded amazing. I wanted to join some of those. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I mean, with school, it, it's I mean, yeah, it, it, it is pretty structured. It's, it's not really designed. Um, it, it's sort of like it, it mirrors the work day sort of with the eight hour structure and all that. So, um, but, you know, there's other ways to encourage socialization. Um, so even, you know, for those of you that are, are, you know, believe in a faith, you know, there's churches, synagogues, temples, you know, all that, that's socialization right there. Um, there's the there's clubs you know ymca is you know is public there's you know there's all these things that are out there that you can do and that you can join and and then they're free yeah. so oh right? one other thing i want to add yeah Sometimes we get so stuck on socializing our children's the, our children the real i think a, a, a much bigger need because your children will find friends a much bigger yeah. need parents if you are homeschooling find yourself a bunch of homeschooling friends because you need the support yes. when when because you're with the kids a lot of the time even if you're bringing them to other events you get you need the, the, the support of friends who understand what you're going through i'm not saying get rid of your old friends but mm -hmm. you're you need friends that understand what it's like to 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 sometimes not have a break for several days away from these children. So sometimes, you know, your, your life revolving around them, all of your activities involving them, we, we need to remember that you're a full grown human being who has, who has uh, habits and likes and, 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 and things that you want to do that have nothing to do with your children. Um, so please make sure you get friends. Oh, well, I mean, where do you find them? Because at least with, with you know with schools there's like the like the drive-ins and the pull-outs you know when you pick up your kids so i mean where do you find them well some of my some of my closest homeschool buddies um they were the leaders with me um with our our homeschool um support group um with, with homeschool new york they were they've been in the classical conversations community with me um so we were hanging out every week um, I call lunchtime parent teacher time. Um, we're the parent and the teacher, and so we talk to each other about what's going on. Um, uh, when we do homeschool trips, like I have a group of friends, like we do trips together. I was I, I was blessed to have one of my really good friends. The first year I started homeschooling, she decided to homeschool too. So I came, I homeschooled with a buddy. Um, so if you can convince your family and friends to homeschool with you, that's even better. <laughs> awesome, awesome. All right, so I see some comments here about, um, a, uh, I guess, a typical schedule in terms of homeschooling. So uh, Dominique, who is here, she says that she does a 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. schedule, some days that it changes. Um, Tina said she does 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. or 2 p.m., uh, but you can homeschool around your home life, so it is 
flexible, so it's not the typical eight to five. What what do you uh, what do you recommend as a good schedule in terms of? I mean, can you homeschool for three hours a day, two hours a day? Does it have to be eight hours? You're probably gonna, not going to need that much time. It's surprising to me how much time is actually uh, flittered away in the classroom situation at public school because there, you know, there's designations during the day. Uh, but uh, in your home, your child can actually go on autopilot after a while. You'll be surprised. You'll you know, you teach those foundational skills and they're, they, they can just go and do it at their own pace, which is a good thing too, because they're, they're using those time management skills and organizational skills. But uh, the, your, I see most of my students one time a week and I can bring a child up to par in a, a fairly short period of time, once a week for 45 minutes to an hour. So you can imagine what could be done in a day of, of, of homeschooling, in a week of homeschooling. You just don't need that much time. Yeah. It's, it's not like the public school at all. Absolutely. Our first year was very unstructured. Um, I wanted the flexibility of them what one let me rephrase that it was it wasn't it wasn't all that cut and dry it was really i didn't want to deal with cranky children so let's be clear i didn't want to drag a child out of bed who didn't wasn't ready to face the day and fight with them until they were ready so i let them sleep until they were ready now she was originally she was second grade so you know like like jan said it didn't take all day to teach second grade material um later on as I started working from home, I, I switched that because I just couldn't accommodate you waking up whenever you felt like it. Um, so she, they, they both do get up in the morning, um, get their some, get themselves ready. Um, and I do instruction in the morning. So between eight and 12, I'm just I'm going back and forth between the two kids. I'm um, actually, the, my, my first, it's the first hour and a half, my oldest, and then, then the, the youngest gets the next two hours. I'm going through everything that I need to teach them. And then they're on their own for the rest of the day. Um, now he is, my son is now in seventh grade and my daughter's a senior. So there's very, there's very little that I'm physically teaching them. Um, so that does, it doesn't count for probably when she was in second grade, we maybe spent five hours. We didn't do five hours straight, not second grade, but like fourth or fifth grade, we spent about five hours, but it wasn't a straight five hours. Um, and the other thing is the beauty of homeschooling. I had the opportunity for two years to homeschool my niece. So she came over to our home. Um, and one of the biggest differences that I, I feedback I got from her, she said, you do all the fun stuff when I'm not here. And I, had, I began to realize that a lot of our, while we did some book stuff, a lot of our learning and experiences were life. And I just couldn't script that. So for instance, when we were doing um, plant cell and animal cell, it happened to be around the time of my daughter's birthday. And so we made her birthday cake a plant cell and an animal cell. <laughs> so I wasn't gonna wait until Monday morning when my niece came over to do her birthday. Her birthday was on the weekend. Or when we watched, we were doing Greek and Roman gods and we did a movie marathon of Percy Jackson and the Little Mermaid, who happened to be cousins, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> And like those were on the weekends. Um, we went away for a three week trip so to Chicago and like that, those, those learning opportunities are everywhere. They don't have to be, it doesn't have to be strictly book learning. And so that doesn't, that doesn't have to be at a certain time of day or a certain day of the week. Okay, that's, that's, that's beautiful. So now, I mean, do you, do you, do homeschooling parents still follow, I guess, the school schedule in that, okay, um, like July and August, you're off, uh, you know, December's like Christmas time. And I mean, do they still follow, do they still follow that, that schedule or? Many parents do. All, you know, off in, in April and they go to school and like, <laughs> Like how do you celebrate Christmas in July? Like how you know is it? 
<laughs> you guys um, don't follow that 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 schedule. So we haven't um, for the last few years, but many parents do because it's what they know and because their family and friends are also off during that time. Um, for a large part of our homeschooling time, my family was in the South. And so since they started school in August, we started school in August, um, primarily so that my daughter wasn't trying to call her cousins when they were in school. Because so it was summer and for her and they were in school. Um, and our home, we take birthdays as national holidays. So we skip a few holidays that we we just we're just like I love I love our our military. I have several I have several members of my family that are in the military, but I don't take Veterans Day off because my birthday is also in November, and so is my son's. And so we take there's two other days that we take off for that month. So we we work during Veterans Day. Um, we actually take so we we go from August to May. We want to be done by May, um, and we take off about a month in in uh december so from pretty much thanksgiving until three kings day in january we're off uh you can also use the summer for uh you choose what you want to learn this summer one mm -hmm. subject that you really want to know or and it can be like crochet or something if they want to do something like that so uh, the the more you can give a child the uh independence uh, and choice the more cooperation you usually get. Absolutely. Yeah, we do gym in the summer because my my kids do kayaking. So they they have no physical education during the school year. Not, not they move, obviously, but um, like gym is in the summer. My daughter, we did theater one summer. So we went to all these different plays and she's read a bunch of plays and we wrote a, 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 a play. Um, so it's it, it really, there's really so much flexibility that you're going to find 180 days, um, which is what New York requires. Um, when those 180 days are, they don't they don't regulate. And I just to recall, if anyone's anyone who's listening live, school school field trips are school days, so don't count those days off. <laughs> there you go. Very very important. Um, so I mean one. One concern, um, I mean, I talked about is, is budget, right? So, you know, finding a curriculum that fits your budget, but um, I mean, homeschooling in general, like, is it, if you guys can touch on, like, is it expensive? Is it is it cheap? Like, you know, can you do it on a, a limited budget? I mean, more than just curriculum, but it's, it's, it's a whole, it's all the trips and all that, like, you know, budget is a big factor, so. Do you need a lot of a lot of money to to homeschool? Um, I had no money <laughs> my first year, so I bought nothing. I pay. I bought absolutely nothing, which is why I said sometimes just have an intention and a prayer. <laughs> um, <laughs> my first year, all of my curriculum came from the library. Um, by by late November, I bought a math book, but that was the only thing that I purchased that year. Um, I started a co-op, I, I joined a co-op the second year, and I tutored at that co-op to pay for the co-op. Um, same thing, I then took on, Classical Conversations does offer opportunities um, for parents to direct or tutor, and that you do get paid for that. So my, my, my work um, as part of the community helped allow me to stay in the community and pay for it um, throughout, throughout these many years. This is actually my first year in 11 years that I've actually paid for multiple um, programs. I mentioned earlier, my son's in karate and um, my daughter's in dance. Those are, the, it's probably the first time in a number of years I've actually been paying for those. So this is probably my, this is my, this is by far my most expensive homeschool year. Um, and because we're in a better position financially than we were uh, year one, um, but I, I did a lot of free programs um, she, or she, I applied for the scholarship of the programs, or I worked um, to support the program by volunteering so that, that my kids could go for free. So there is, um, it can be expensive if you're not watching it. Um, because every little thing, the, the $100 for this program and $75 for this program, it adds up. Um, but if you're willing, I say if you're there anyway, because a lot of our programs are require the parents to stay on, on, on premise, if I'm going to be there and I have the opportunity to work and you're going to give me the opportunity to get it for free, that's often the, the, the route that I took. 
Yeah, uh, a lot of the things that are, the manipulatives that I've shown you before, uh, these are just made uh, f from uh, index cards, so you can make your own. In fact, it's a good idea to have your child do these and make their own packet of cards as, uh, you know, that's the learning process too. I use a deck of cards instead of flashcards. Mm -hmm. uh, a pair of dice that you roll the dice and multiply the, the, the uh, whatever you have there. Th these are all free. The, the YouTube channel that I'm telling you about, this, this was, these videos, these, uh, the, these over 1,200 educational videos that I have on this website are my gift to you. It's free. You know, I, I'm at a point in my career that I don't need to have the money. I've worked, I've worked decades to be where I am now. And I, I just feel that it's a, a time to give back. So the, these, these resources are, you know, look for your free things. The, the library is a great resource for that too. Yeah, I think um, I think Darren might have mentioned um, like field trips and things, and some parents being afraid for field trips and scheduling them. Um, the library has far more than books. Um, our library lets you we get passes to museums and to various locations. Um, we, our library offers um, we can we can borrow a telescope. Um, so there's there's a lot of different things that your library your library offers. And Jan, YouTube, I, I've termed it YouTube University. Um, my history curriculum was on Netflix and Amazon, which I was yeah. already paying for. Um, but my science curriculum was YouTube. We watched so many episodes of The Magic School Bus uh, um, on YouTube. Um, we got the book from the library. We watched the video, and we 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 then we watched subsequent videos about like the my matter of fact, my very first day homeschooling, I was sick, and so we turned on that's that's how I started watching YouTube videos because we turned on um, the the episode of Magic School Bus where one of the kids gets sick and they they go into his body, and then we watched a bunch of anatomy videos and, and things like that. So you really don't need to spend money, but you're gonna you're gonna then be, need to be creative. That's right. And it's fun to be creative with it. You'll, it it's very invigorating to do that. Uh, I remember that uh, my daughter and son-in-law were having some trees cut down in the backyard, and these were pretty tall. So I gathered my grandson on my lap, boom, and we watched YouTube videos on how trees are taken down. And when the, the actual event came, he knew. He knew that the, how they were going to branch them, how they climbed up the tree. It was pretty fun. Those resources are out there. Take advantage of them. Yeah, because even Broadway, theater theater can be quite expensive. Um, and we have done nearly 25 shows this year. And most of them we've gotten discount tickets on. We spent $20 to see Wicked on Broadway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so like there, there are opportunities out there, but you've got to look for them. So something to search for is search for free curriculum. Easy peasy, you mentioned, uh, Gabrielle, earlier. Easy peasy is free. Um, the library is free. Um, there are often discounts from HSLDA. I give away some of my books every year to new homeschoolers. Um, so there are curriculum swaps you can do. Um, often parents will trade uh, and barter services. Um, so there, there's a lot, and you can literally look up free things to do in whatever county this week. Yes. The library has a bunch of, we did a book club at the library. We did science projects at the library. Um, you don't see the same kids all the time, but it's an opportunity to have access to stuff that you don't have to pay for yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank Yes. Thank you for, for sharing that. Definitely check out your local libraries, you guys. All right. So what do you guys say to people that say, um, you know, that they wish they can homeschool, but they work full time, you know, or, you know, they, you know, they wish they can homeschool, but, um, you know, they're, they're single parents, um, you know, who's going to watch their kid? Well, they can't watch their kids. Who's going to watch their kids? So what, what do you say to those parents that say they wish they could, but they have all these they have other responsibilities that they have to do. 
I love that question. Um, first of all, I already said everybody homeschools. So you're already doing it. Um, so whether you, whether, if the issue is that you want to just pull them out of school, that's a very different story than um, you want to be able to add things to their educational, um, for their educational enrichment, because you can do that without pulling them out of school. Um, you have the you have the weekends, you have after school, you have the summers where you can teach them whatever it is you want to teach them without pulling them out of school and 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 losing that opportunity. I'm not against public school. I think there's some people that, that public school is a huge resource for, for parents who need it um, and want it. Um, but if you do desire to pull to pull your children out of school and give them a different a different um, opportunity for their education, Jan gave a, a great example. Let's so build, go, go with your community. What grandparents are available? Um, I homeschooled my niece for two years. Um, so there are other resources that, that may come into play. Um, I think uh, one of the other speakers mentioned online. Um, some states uh, have you know online opportunities. There are some you can kind of kind of it's kind of a hybrid. You're technically enrolled in an online school, but you're doing it at home. So there are lots of today's technology gives parents a lot of options when it comes to the ability to, I'd say, I'd say choose an alternative uh, educational option. It may not be considered homeschooling because, or you may not consider it homeschooling because you're not the one teaching. Um, but if your if your goal is to put them in a different academic space, that is available through technology, through community resources. Um, or simply being creative. I've had parents who um, work full time, and they their their kids are older, and so they homeschool them in the in the evenings and afternoons. Um, parents who do like they're nurses, and so they work like thirty six hours over the weekends, and they're home during the week. If your schedule allows it, for your your if you if you are married and your schedules flip, um, maybe husband could be with them one time a day, and the mom can be with them another time a day. Um, and even if you're not married, if, if dad's involved in the process or you have another uh, partner involved in the process, there are lots of ways to do it. Um, and I, I mentioned I work from home. I work full time. I work two part time jobs, but my positions are flexible. So um, I was able to work that around my homeschooling. One of them is a homeschooling company. So that's pretty that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, but the other one, they knew full well that my priority was our homeschool. And so when work conflicted with that, homeschool takes precedent. And, and I would say if you're a little skittish about it, take it slowly. Uh, there's always that bedtime story, you know, that you can read. And, and uh, if you, if you uh, avail yourself to what things are important to have your child know, like, like life skills, perhaps it can just be your cooking together or you're fixing something together, or you're putting a shelf together. These are all, your your curriculum could be the humbleness of your daily life together. Absolutely. And there are also plenty of business opportunities available. Um, uh, before I started homeschooling, I had searched up a number of things of work from home opportunities. Um, some of them weren't businesses, um, but I did mystery shopping for almost a year. Um, and then I, I became a mystery shopping scheduler. So instead of the one going out to do the shops, I was the one calling other people to schedule shops. And so there are a lot of opportunities that are available with today's technology where you can still earn a decent living um, and be able to, to homeschool your children. You just like I said, same thing with the curriculum. If you want to do it for, for free, you've got to be creative. If you um, have a challenge um, that precludes you from a, a, a regular school day, you just, just got to be creative with it. Absolutely, absolutely. And of course, as, as Darren mentioned, you know, homeschooling co-ops might uh, be another resource for you as well. You can just plop your kids there and, you know, and leave them. All right. <laughs> so if, you know, if that's another resource for you guys as well. All right. So I'm going to start to wind things down. Um, so any final words of wisdom that you would like to share? <laughs> Don't all talk at once. I think I'm spent. <laughs> uh, just uh, don't be afraid to do this. You're you're gonna it. The benefits far outweigh your your fears. Uh, you're giving your child something very special. 
when you do that, uh, when you homeschool or spend time with your child. And uh, you will find you will have a, a learning curve yourself. Absolutely. I would say um, make a decision. If your desire is to homeschool, just start with that. The how will come. How do you make it work? How do you pay for it? Uh, how do you find support? How do you do the reporting? How do you do testing? That will come. But once you set the intention um, that that's, that's what you want to do, you'll start to see the answers will just start popping up. You'll meet someone, you'll get, you're, listen, um, it's a bit of a conspiracy thing, but yes, your phone is listening to you. And sometimes it's a good thing because they'll hear that you're wanting something and then they'll show you an advertisement for it. <laughs> <laughs> so talk about the fact that you want to homeschool. Your phone will probably give you a co-op or, or a resource. <laughs> um, but yeah, just set the intention and let the how come afterwards. All right, beautiful. And, and I'll also say um, that, you know, it's it's never too too early uh, to homeschool and it's never too late to homeschool. So, um, you know, if maybe you're in, in public, or your child's in public school until um, eighth grade and you decide, you know what, I'm gonna pull them out now. You know, uh, I'll homeschool them for the rest of high school. You know, you can do that, or, or maybe you want to start as. You don't even want to send them to pre-K, right? You'll, you, you know, you you can homeschool as soon as they're. I want to say legally six. What's the youngest you can homeschool? Is it six? Oh, well, I, officially, I, yeah. <laughs> officially. Uh, six months. Six months in my world. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> once, once you're out of the womb, you're homeschooling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So you can start, your child can start early in life. They can start later in life. Or, you know, maybe you 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 love homeschooling, you're homeschooling your child now, but things change and, you know, maybe you want to put them back in public school or what, you know, but you can make that transition. So, you know, if that's your desire, that's fine. But you can, as you can change your curriculum at any time, you can change your homeschooling routine at, at any time. Yeah. So I just add, Gabrielle, I, think yeah. I, I want to make sure we don't forget, like both of these, both of these other women on here with me are, are both tutors and they're available. Yeah. You don't have, homeschooling doesn't mean you've got to teach everything yourself. And so take yeah. advantage of professionals um, who can provide the service for you. Um, if you can afford it, um, or if you can find something that's within your price range, you know, um, you don't want to do math, let someone else teach math. You don't want to do reading, uh, let them, let someone else do that. Like homeschooling doesn't necessarily mean you've got to teach every subject. So take advantage of, of um, the businesses that are, that are available to you to support you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, definitely. Uh, tutors. Uh, co-ops, um, assisting tools. You don't have to do the teaching yourself. All right, ladies, thank you again for joining me another year. And thank you guys for for, for sticking it out <laughs> this long. Uh, so I do appreciate you guys being here. Um, so while you guys are up here, I'm just going to let you guys do your shout out. So, um, so I'll just have you guys talk one at a time and uh, shout out your business. So I'll start with you, Tamara. Okay. Um, again, my name is Tamara Somerville. Um, I, if you're in New York and uh, particularly in the greater New York area, um, you can join my Facebook group, um, Westchester Homeschoolers um, on Facebook. Um, lots of resources for you there. Um, I do ask that you are local uh, to like to the area um, and that you are a homeschooling family or considering homeschooling um, in order to be part of the group. Um, I'm also a area representative for classical conversation. So if you're interested in a classical Christian um, educational co-op, um, we host those throughout the entire country. Um, my number um, and my email are there. If you're looking for particularly um, resources on um, homeschool in particular, African American homeschoolers and why African American families and why we homeschool is available on Amazon. Um, I have a new book coming out um, specifically on homeschool reporting, and you can post that. You can send me an email, and I will send you that um, 
send you that when it, it is when it comes out. Gabrielle, I will send you a copy. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so we'll have that ready. And if you want to just send it off to anyone from today's uh, from today's call, that's fine as well. All right. So reach out um, if you're interested. I um, just want to have some. Just want to answer some questions. I just want a, a veteran homeschool parent to talk to. So please feel free to to reach out either on Facebook, phone, email, phone, and text, and, and Facebook are probably the best ones. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, all right. And Jan, I'm just going to have you go ahead. Please shout out your business. Hey, I do private tutoring. I work with parents who homeschool. I work with curriculum. I work with how they how they actually can uh, get their own skills up to par so they're uh, they're they're feeling confident with their child. Uh, the the uh, over twelve hundred educational videos are on YouTube at Jan Six Tutor One. I suggest that when you go there, you click playlists and then scroll to find the playlist that you are are interested in that meets your needs. Uh, the the two books that I wrote the the Teach Your Child to Learn and Teach Your Preschooler to Learn are available on Amazon. And uh, just, uh, I just want to tell you how much I respect you for uh, deciding to, to homeschool. This is an, uh, an act of love that you're giving your child. And uh, I know that it's going to be reciprocated because uh, you're, yeah, it, it's just a, a, a a blessing to work with your child. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All this is awesome. Thank you guys. I'm gonna remove you now. All right. Okay, so before I get to the other um speakers because they had to run, let me just make sure I get this raffle. All right, so um it is now officially closed. Um, I don't have a cheesy sound effect for a drum roll, <laughs> but that's okay. So, but all right. And the winners of the raffle are okay. We have a Naisha from New York. So, congratulations. I will reach out to you. I have a Hudson from Virginia, so congratulations. I have a, uh, a Tiffany from also from New York, congratulations. And Miss Tina, uh, congratulations from Louisiana. You are the winner of our raffle. And let me show you one of the many things that you guys have won. Uh, so Jan's book, one of Jan's book here. So congratulations. Your guys are going to get a copy of that. This one, uh, Homeschool Freedom. This is from the HSLDA. So you guys are going to get that. And this lovely jar of barbecue sauce, which is a, a donation from one of my many network of, my, not my many, my many, my network of many entrepreneurs as well as a bunch of other stuff, which I have to sort through. So, uh, but congratulations to those four people. Let me just say the names again. So Naisha from New York, Hudson from Virginia, Tiffany from New York, and Tina from Louisiana. Congratulations. You guys are winners. So I will be reaching out to you at the end of this program. All right, great. So um, before I close, let me just... Um, take a moment to shout out the other speakers. Unfortunately, they had to run. Um, uh, thank, thank you, Tamara. Thank you. Um, so let me just take a moment to shout out the other speakers before I close. All right. So the, the first speaker, uh, Dominique Gates, um, she provides assistance if you need help sorting through the, the homeschooling uh, paperwork and, and all that good stuff. Um, so if you need any help with that, she does provide one-on-one -on -one consulting services. 
Um, so just you may want to check with her to see if she does for your state. Um, but if you want to reach out to her, she just has a Facebook page <laughs> right now. Uh, so but her Facebook page is Gates of Learning, and she is also a tutor. So you have many resources for tutors. You have myself, you have Jan, you have Dominique. So if you are looking for tutoring services, you have all three of us. Um, but yes, um, if you want maybe direct assistance with the homeschooling process, reach out uh, to Dominique as well. Dominique Gates was the first speaker. Unfortunately, she had to run. Uh, so I'm just going to shout her out. So make sure you follow her Facebook page. It is Gates of Learning. Um, so make sure you follow her on Facebook. Um, let's see what else. Um, uh, let's see. All right. So Darren Jones, he also had to run, uh, but he is directly from the HSL DA. So I, that is a resource that you've heard multiple times throughout the show. So I encourage you to, so, uh, you know, to, to not subscribe, but to subscribe to their services, right? Um, so to help you navigate the homeschooling journey as well, you can also follow them on Facebook. It is just HSLDA. Simple as that. So follow them on Facebook. You can also email Darren at Darren at HSLDA.org. Um, you can also visit uh, his, well, the website of the HSLDA, which is basically HSLDA.org. Um, but you can also call Darren directly. His phone number is on the screen, but I'll just read it out loud. 540-338-5600. Uh, so if you want to speak to Darren, because um, he's also an attorney, so there may be specific questions that you may have pertaining homeschooling that we didn't address today, or maybe it's a little more complex, right? I encourage you to, to reach out to Darren. His information is on the screen, but it is also um, in the description as well. So if you're watching this on the replay, it is in the description as well. I might also put this on my, my podcast. So either way, it is in the description. So make sure make sure you reach out to, to Darren as well, as he is directly from the HSL DA. I also am going to shout out Laura Nattinger. She was the, the pre-recording. She was the one who talked about homeschoolers, getting them to college. So maybe you have a home, you're homeschooling your child and you want to gear them up for college or you just want to know more about it. I encourage you to reach out to her as well. I just have an email <laughs> for her. It is lnattinger at gmail.com. So if you have any homeschooling questions, if you want to learn more about the college process and how to get your kid ready for college, I encourage you to reach out to her as well. Her email address is on the screen, and it is also in the description. All right, so I encourage, those are all of my speakers. I encourage you to follow them all on their social media, email them, email them, call them, support their projects. You know, they're volunteering their time to be here today. So please support them in everything that they do. And if you have any questions specifically, reach out to all of the speakers, but this information is available to you. And I encourage you guys to take advantage of all of this information. All right, so I am going to close this out. I wanted to take this moment to remind you guys that this event is put on by my tutoring company, A Step Ahead Tutoring Services. So of course, um, I am one of many tutoring resources available. So if um, you, your child is struggling academically or maybe you're homeschooling and you just don't want to teach, <laughs> you don't want to deal with it. You know you want to pull your kid out of school, but you just don't want to do the teaching. That's okay. You can turn them over to us. Um, let us help you with that. So the information is on the screen right now, but I encourage you to check out our website www.stepaheadtutoringservices.com. Uh, you, you're, you, you're watching this on YouTube right now. Uh, check that like button. Check that subscribe button. You're watching this on uh, Facebook. 
check that like button, you guys. Uh, so support us on social media as well. We're also on uh, TikTok and Instagram. So uh, please follow us on our on our social media as well if you want to learn more about our tutoring services. Um, we also um, do test prep, one-on-one -on -one tutoring. We do virtual services as well as in-person services, but just for our local area of New York, unfortunately. Uh, but if you are not in the New York area, but we do have virtual services that we extend across the United States. So, uh, so if you are interested in any kind of tutoring service or any kind of academic help, let us know. The website again is www.astepaheadtutoringservices.com. And you can also check us out on all of our social media platforms. All right, you guys, I thank you again for joining me uh, for another year of Homeschooling 101. I hope that you took something um, from this event, and I hope that you uh, make wonderful decisions with it. Um, the replay will be immediately available as soon as I close. You can watch the replay on YouTube and Facebook. I will also make it available on my podcast as well called Hot Topics. So you can check that out as well on your on your favorite podcast platform. Check out Hot Topics as well. Uh, this event will also be available on that. And I thank you guys for joining me for another year. And, and um, you know, I want to make sure that you guys have all the information that you need to make a very important decision regarding schooling and this very important decision for yourself and for your family. And if there's any questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out to any one of us. We will, we will help you. So thank you guys again. And I hope that you join us for the, uh, the next virtual event. Thank you guys and have a wonderful day. Bye guys.